but I lost my dignity. Uh, I lost the uh, life. The audience. Thank you, colleagues. I'm holding with apologies from Commissioner Tolly, uh, Deputy Mayor Isles from Fakatani District <coughs> Council, and sadly uh, called away to more important businesses, Brent Crow from the New Zealand Police. Very sincere apologies. Then none. I'll move seconded. Councillor Lee's all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against carried. There is no public forum. Uh, items not on the agenda as part of the chairman's report. Uh, I will make reference to a letter that was circulated to you all. Uh, it was from local government New Zealand. It was dated, the draft was dated the 7th of September. I know all the mayors in the room here today have seen the letter and I presume it put your signatures to it. And I'll make reference to it uh, when I do my chairman's report. Um, there are no changes to the order of business. Uh, are there any conflicts of interest anyone feels they need to declare today? Being none, moving on. The previous minutes, uh, with someone with a pretty good memory, uh, moved the minutes of Thursday the 19th of May on page 7, hard copy, is a reasonably true and accurate record of that meeting. Councillor Lees, moved? Yes, I moved. Okay, moved. Her Worship Mayor Reister seconded. Any matters arising, anybody from those minutes? Councillor, Your Worship Mayor Chavik, are you waving at me or are you putting your hand up? You're, you're on mute. Uh, okay, this is excellent. Okay, I'll put those all those, all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against carried. Moving on, the Chairperson's report. Uh, Lorraine and Greg, are you going to present this? Um, but before you start, as I said, uh, I'll make reference to the letter um, that local government New Zealand is sending on behalf of the mayors and chairs of New Zealand. Uh, it came out of the local government conference this year that many of you were at, uh, whereby councils overwhelmingly voted that they would call for an independent review of transport funding to commence in the next 12 months. 96% of those councils uh, have supported the streamit. Um, and it pertains to transport investments in New Zealand, uh, and they want a review to consider the funding of new developments and maintenance of programs. So uh, I circulated that amongst everyone. I did put my signature to it, and I was advised that most of you in the room as mayors had already put the signatures to it. So uh, I trust that was just a formality. So, Greg, before you start, would you like to introduce yourself? And uh, many in the room, of course, will know you from a previous life. Um, but welcome to your first regional transport committee. Is worship there, Weber? I'm well, sorry. Like, you know, I wonder if we may take this as read. Most of the information here is older than I, I think. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure Greg will just hone in on the salient points. So, pretty good. That goes to him. Do you want to um, introduce the report? But I'll just introduce myself. I don't think, hopefully, I don't need to. I'll, I've met all of you, I think, looking around the room. Um, Greg Campbell, um, I'm acting as the interim uh, transport director here at the Regional Council. All of you will be aware I came up to the bay up, uh, back in May. Uh, saw you all then, had some various conversations, really appreciated those. And subsequently, for my sons, um, was asked to, to actually start the work here to uh, form the, tra the new transport grouping within the Regional Council. So here I am. And I'll hand to Nimbus just to introduce the chair's report, then we'll show hand back to Lorraine and myself. Uh, Tena Koto, Mayors, uh, Chair, uh, Councillors, uh, welcome. We've got the Chairman's Report on page uh, 18 of your agendas. Uh, 
uh, we will take the information uh, as is, given there's a number of updates uh, that we're providing in the Chairman's report. But key for us really is to reflect, given this is the last meeting of the triennial, on all of the key highlights. So we'll pass back to staff to reflect on those highlights. Welcome, Lorraine. Thank you. Um, through you, Chair. Uh, Yes, I think the overarching background to the training was COVID, but not um, withstanding, we uh, the committee achieved a um, considerable amount of work through the training. Um, unfortunately, I first have to note um, there's an error in relation to the mode shift plans. I said that the I would say the Eastern Bay, the Western Bay should read the Eastern Bay. Um, so if we can just get that corrected. Um, on page 24. Of the agenda, and it's a, the um, the second um, box in the table. Um, some highlights included the appointment of two new advisors over the training for the AA and for um, Kimberrail. And um, also of note was the um, adoption of the RLTC 2021. Um, and um, people will cast their mind, the members will cast their mind back to um, at the time it was adopted, there was. Um, such talk of a lot of um, and challenges were made um, around uh, the provisions for um, greenhouse emissions and carbon reduction in the RLTP. Um, at that time, we, we um, were judicially reviewed on the RLTP, um, but on other issues, we did our own independent review and um, the RLTP was considered a, a well-prepared document. Um, well done to the committee on that. Other things that we did was a number of um, submissions, letters and petitions, um, and there's updates in the report um, on some of those, um, and in particular supporting the infrastructure acceleration fund applications, and they haven't all been decided on, but two have, and that's Rotorua Lakes and um, the Western Bay for Amokura Interchange. Probably leave it at that. Okay. Happy to take any questions. Just worship their webinars asked that we uh, take it as read. Uh, any questions or comments, anyone on the chair that council needs? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just with regard to the um, the item on the RLTP and the process for that, I, re I um, recollect a lot of debate about what projects should be in and prioritised and what projects should be out and how we should treat the different types of projects, um, mostly because we have had situations where we had a committed list which was outside the RLTP um, and wasn't prioritised. Um, and then we had items that the R uh, RTC wanted considered and requested that they be um, considered by the NLTP or Waka Kaitaihi for inclusion. So I was wondering if we could request Waka Kaitaihi to provide advice to um, all uh, um, RTCs on the appropriate way to deal with each of these different classes of projects so that we don't have any confusion going forward about whether um, a project that has been committed out um, funding out of a an external fund other than the um, NLTP is dealt with in our RLTP. For example, um, if the funding gets taken away, as has happened previously, and we get left with a gap in the program, um, we would have wanted it in the program had it not had, had committed funding, which then has disappeared. So um, I, I do believe that there is scope for um, guidance by Waka Kotahi to every RTC on how we deal with the different classes of projects. And maybe, David, you'd like to comment on that. Okay. There's a couple of people wanting to ask questions. Do you to come to you after the worship mayor turn and then his worship mayor river? Thank you. I want to pick up on the, the spelling mistake and, and thank you for correcting that. 
Um, I guess what I would like some, um, I understand with um, load shift and demand management um, work that's going to be considered, I just want to be really reassured that there's uh, resource and funding available for that work that needs to be done. I'd hate to think we get to uh, get to the end of that and, and not, didn't, nothing's changed. And, and I know that the that Eastern Bay County Council is really keen to collaborate and do what we can to help in that in that space. But I guess we, it isn't our ultimate responsibility. We to need to know that we're going to be resourced or helped in that process uh, by the regional council and that, that there is a game plan and resourcing already allocated towards the development of an improved plan. Come back to that. Is Worship there with us? Thank you. Um, at the risk of upsetting the deputy chair, um, <laughs> we have a resolution on the books already agreeing to a thorough review of the processes used and that was nearly 12 months ago. Uh, I'm pretty sure I know what the report will say. I also know in 2012, at the beginning of the RLTP, we, state, we started the process with previously approved projects. So if some of us have forgotten the way we used to do it, um, I suggest we just let that process come through and not ask other people to run around in circles again. Just face up to the reality. Thank you. There was a review plan for the Kuwait um, Biennium, as we know. Um, David, would you like to join this discussion now, or would you want to? No. I don't think anyone else wants to make some, any comments prior to you, so go for it. I'm uh, happy to respond to that, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, we've got a review to come. I think that we will we'll take the learnings from that review um, on as we start to move towards the next RLTP, which I think we need to do pretty soon in the new training. <laughs> um, one of the things that I would like us to do, though, is, is have our investment advisors come early and have a conversation about um, the multiplicity of different funding sources uh, that fund the transport investment, not just the NLTP. And I think that's one of the things you really need to clarify and then have a risk conversation um, because some of those funding sources are government funding, right? They're government appropriations. They're not, they're not necessarily an LTP. Um, we don't have control over those and other decisions can influence those. So I think we need to have a risk management conversation around where we put investments. Uh, yeah, we can do that pretty early in the, in the um, RLTP process. Your Worship, Mayor Chadwick, welcome. Thank you. Um, I, I agree that very early in the triennial, because you're going to have very new faces around the table, before we hurtle into even a review process, there needs to be an orientation for all coming um, delegates to this committee meeting, um, so that they're all starting from the same page, rather than the review because they won't know what we're reviewing and I know for us it'll be both Mayor, myself and Deputy Dave will be replaced by new members and uh, so I think a workshop very early in the triennial is a way to agree how you're going to work together going forward. It's just a suggestion before you get into review processes that'll add confusion. Thank you. Thanks, David, do you want to say something? Um, perhaps just with um, highlighting that we are going, we've prepared a BIM, a briefing for the incoming members um, for Wakakotahi post um, election. And so we'll be coming to all of your um, council secretaries asking for a slot to, to go through um, much of what um, Mayor Chadwick's talking about, which is, you know, how is the network funded, um, what's your role as councillors, et cetera. But actually, then I think off the back of that, a workshop in, in the Regional Transport Committee to get a bit deeper would be really, really useful. Yes. Happy to support that. Okay. Is Worship Mayor Weber then Angus? I would to make the recommendation, but I'll hold that if there's still questions. Angus, floor Jules. Welcome. I'd just like to point out, I mean, we'd be quite happy to come alongside with Tahi to cover a bit of run investment, but <coughs> all our other major projects which are not funded by the NLTP, so it's useful to run through it. Wonderful. Um, yeah, we've moved it, but before I call for a second, the 
some reason, would you like to make reference to the regional road safety portion of that, which we normally attach, attach to the tail end of the Chair's report? Anything you'd like to highlight there? And I'll combine the two of them. Uh, you know, go to committee members. Uh, just to note that, uh, as per usual, we have our regional road safety update uh, appended uh, on page 27, which just provides an update in terms of uh, safety activities across Eastern Bay, Rotorua, uh, and Western Bay. We did have extensive presentations, as you recall, at the last meeting. Who worship me, Turner? I think. In the Eastern Bay of Plenty, one of the things, or well, perhaps I'll just speak to the Whakatane District Council and say that, you know, we, we would really appreciate, um, with uh, particularly Waka Kotahi, greater um, engagement with us when they're designing road safety solutions. Um, there have been, there's been one I can think of where the solution then had to be removed because it created its own set of problems. And we've got another proposal on the, on the table at present um, that we're not we're not debating the intent, which is to reduce to increase road safety and the road to zero. That we're completely in support of the intention, um, but there are aspects of the design that we think are going to be counterproductive, um, and particularly the cheese cutter, <laughs> locals call it down the centre of what's what's quite a, Sorry, well, is there another name for it? I, I just really like it if this committee or anyone can stop using such a pejorative term for a safety instrument. Absolutely. It's not a cheese cutter, it's a lifesaver. Yes. Can we start? Just stop right. using those terms, please. Okay, well, I apologise if that's been offensive, but that's the two mates that the locals are calling it. And I'm just saying that it's creating a huge number of other issues for people. In the interests of road safety, I understand what the intention is and I support the, I support the goals. But actually, we just think that a little bit more of consultation with, for instance, police uh, and, uh, regarding um, what they're dealing with on that stretch of road. Uh, those who live on that stretch of road who are now going to have to come out, go drive that tractor down the road, go through a roundabout and come back in the direction they want to go to. So it's, a, it's kind of a very inconvenient at that, at that level. Um, and there is concerns about the fact that um, it isn't a, a wide bit of state highway and as such the, we're concerned about some other uh, risks that could come off the back of that. The, the, the roundabouts that are proposed and some of those other things are excellent and, we, and I've only had positive feedback about those. Um, and also the fact that there's one intersection that wasn't included that is probably the most dangerous from locals' perspective and has been some very close in the emphasis that would have been seriously and probably life-threatening. Um, so I just, I guess what I'm saying is we have a roading team in our council um, that are working in this space all the time and would be very happy to, 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 to give an opinion on those things. And we also think that the police should be more, um, rather than just, I think it's this difference between engagement and consultation. And in consultation, we sort of say, this is what we're going to do. Hope you like it. Con uh, engagement is where we actually say, we're testing out these ideas. Do you have anything else that you'd like to suggest based on local knowledge? And I mean, that's the whole the whole thing of localism is that you bring local knowledge to the table and, and provide advice. And it's not it's not um, we just don't think that that's happening at a, at a, a good enough level. And we are at, to to achieve what's what the intention is. Um, and so we're just we're just asking for a little bit more um, input in those things in the design stage of some of these solutions. Worship there with it. You're having to move, it's so being moved. Send it to worship. I was going to speak to it. Oh, I'm sorry, go for it. Um, you've got to be a little bit careful on how we approach these things and so long as it's evidence based. Because, as David would know full well, the stretch from Waihe to uh, Taranga, the death rate is, and accident rate has dropped significantly with central media barriers and side barriers. So let's is push it with your mic on. Is your mic on? Just be careful. <clears throat> what you wish for, because uh, we've had evidence which says the median barrier is a major safety improvement on, on a, what was known as New Zealand's worst rate, uh, road for death and, and injury. Okay. Oh, it's Worship Mayor Campbell. Yes, um, thank you for that. And uh, um, uh, I think if anyone rides motorbikes, you'll know what that phrase is all about, David. Um, that's, what, that's where that's come from. But I have to agree with uh, Mayor Weber, um, and if you only have to look at uh, 
from Waikakariki into, into Wellington, how that has saved a lot of downtime and, and uh, accident time, I have to say. But um, what, where I'm coming from here, the last time uh, Mr Bridges decided to give us some money over in our way, um, the police were heavily involved, uh, Whakatani, Kawaro, because Kawaro does our main centre, uh, um, service centre is in Whakatani, um, and the annoying part about it, everything was just washed aside and, and they did what they wanted to do anyway, they didn't listen. I have to say that having containment either side, those barriers either side, were we nearly had a, a fatality death at Awakiri when, um, when a car veered off and then went into a head-on with a car coming the other way. They just didn't have anywhere to go. The other thing is, it's, um, um, I don't know if anyone's ever tried to change a tyre um, at any time in the middle of the road. Generally, the only way to do that is wreck your tyre and drive up to where you can actually pull up somewhere. So uh, that's with containment outside. Certainly down the, down the centre, I, I, I tend to agree with that. It's a great idea, but um, I'm, I'm also hearing me turn and when, uh, when <laughs> Farmers come out and they have to drive some kilometres down the road to, to, to do a roundabout. But yeah, thank you very much. Anyway. Um, I had a phone call this morning from our chairman and he shared exactly the same sentiments that you did. Apparently, it came up in a public meeting at Matatar, was it today? Yes, yes. yes. So, uh, no, I know you'll be pleased that you can pay yes. to you. Uh, just, just to reiterate, there are some aspects of, what the, pl of, the, of the plan that are fully supported. The, but the concern is that, and that it's a safety concern about um, what could happen. They, I think people in general are happy about the speed limitations and things like that, but it's, it's not the whole thing. But um, we just are not sure that the fencing thing or the safety barrier down the middle of the road on that particular piece of road is going to um, be helpful. Uh, there's a recommendation on page 18. Um, with your indulgence, Mayor Weber, I will include the recommendation on page 27. That's the one that pertains to sustainable uh, regional road safety. So it's been seconded by the Worship Mayor Turner. I'll put it all those in favour. Please say aye. It's aye. carried. David, floor's yours. You said that was a very big presentation in white <laughs> today, so I'm presumably going to replicate that here. I don't know if I can help it, Mr. Chair. Um, so obviously I'll take the report as always as read, um, Mr. Chair, your indulgence. Um, and I will start the presentation there is from you happy, David, to have questions throughout the presentation? Absolutely. Okay, okay. there you go, everyone. I'll pause <coughs> after each slide. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so, as you all know, um, Missions Reduction Plan has, has come out um, from government. Um, the plan calls for 41% reduction in emissions from the transport sector by 2035, which is an aspirational target, but that is relative to 2019 levels. Um, we are actually on track for that in current progress, but we have got some, you know, the easy, the, the low hanging fruit, I suppose, uh, has, has been picked. And so we've got some real challenges ahead of us to, to reach that. Um, three focus areas for how we're going to try and approach that across the sector, reducing reliance on cars um, and supporting people to walk, cycle and use public transport. And this is one of the key things, we've talked about this a lot. It's one thing to get people out of cars, but in order to do that, you've got to give them viable alternatives. <coughs> Um, rapid adoption of low emissions vehicles, and you've all seen the moves by government to um, subsidise, cross-subsidise the um, uptake of electric vehicles, and um, working with the heavy transport and freight fleet on decarbonisation, and we're already starting to see um, moves by some freight companies towards uh, electric um, trucks, uh, and um, Angus can nod a move towards um, rail um, more and more. It's a no-brainer if we're going to achieve an emissions reduction plan at that scale. Um, we're still waiting for advice from Minister on how to um, reflect that in the investment decisions for the rest of the 21-24 NLTP. Um, but you will recall the undertaking that we won't 
um, we won't run around undoing a whole lot of investments that are already underway. So we're sure we're not going to go start turning things off. Um, I'll just put my glasses on so I can check my notes as I go. <laughs> uh, one of the things we will be doing as we do get that certainty is again working with your investment advisors and ours to make sure that we've got real clarity going into the next RLTP process on how do we reflect these priorities in our investment. Um, and so that will be part of that wider con conversation that we have. I'll pause there in case there's a question. No? Okay. Um, asset management data standards. So this is um, a piece of work that's been underway for quite a while. All of your councils have been involved in this. Um, it's a national um, project to upgrade the asset management data standard across the country. And that's really how do we refer to all of the asset parts of the network. Um, and how do we do that consistently to make sure that we are um, then reflecting what future investments we need to look like to keep the network up. Um, it, essentially, it's rolling out at the moment. The first of the uh, road control authorities will be using it in the next 12 months. Everyone within five years. Um, it should save an awful lot uh, of investment because we will be talking about and managing things consistently. I don't imagine there's too many questions on that, so we'll move on. Um, just a, uh, we are also doing quite a lot of work on our environmental impact. So not just um, you know how do we reduce carbon, but also how do we reduce our footprint generally. Uh, and so we've um, updated our sustainability standard, um, Tayo, which looks at um, how do we better use use, for example, the procurement we do around environmental mitigation. Um, how do we maximise the value of that mitigation work? Um, how do we uh, tailor our investments to minimise the impact we're having? And you, you'll all be familiar with the debate that occurs when we do put large infrastructure into, for example, greenfields areas, and this is part of that. Um, again, unlikely that you've got any questions. Steve. Steve has. Your, your worship. Your just just a little hand up. Thank you. Just a question there for you, David, about gorse reduction along um, Wakakotahi um, Highway. Is that included now in your Taumata Tau? I don't I actually don't know that level of detail, I have to say. Um, it will be in so far as where we are doing mitigation work for planting, for example, we will be doing gorse control. The problem with gorse is, is anyone who's ever tried to control it is you're, you're in for a 20-year fight. Um, and so for many of our sites, this is more about what our long-term maintenance contracts look like when we're doing plantings and things, so we don't lose them or lose the benefit of them. It would just be great if we could have um, eradication in there as well as planting. Thank you. David, hey, just pause a moment. There's worship there, Campbell. Yes, uh, Chair, thank you very much, David. I'll just, just ask a question. This is a, a pet hate of, of mine, and that's the rubbish along our roads, uh, our highways. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that stuff, particularly around the lakes, uh, from Rotorua to, to Pukatani, um, lots of plastics and stuff like that, that actually do end up in, in, in the lake, um, which is a real concern. But even coming coming into town here this morning, um, there's lots and lots of um, rubbish that's not being picked up. And this is not, not unfortunately, you're at the end of the, you're the ambulance at the bottom of it. And this is this is a bad indictment on our so-called green image in this country. And I, and I, I hang my head in shame sometimes, but um, you know, we are not a clean, green country. I don't care what anyone says, when you go along and see rubbish and that stuff, and it all ends up either in the drains or in waterways, and that's a concern. And um, I know that we had a tragic accident uh, a couple of years back, but I'm just wondering where we're going from here on this. Is this going to be an ongoing, or should regional council start looking at it, or what? Um, so, Mr Chair, part of our NOC contracts, which are the maintenance contracts, operations and maintenance contracts, include um, rubbish and general appearance along the roads. We're currently reviewing those contracts. We have reviewed some of them. Um, to, to target um, some of the more reactive standards and be a little bit clearer around expectations of those. Unfortunately, at the moment, I will say in the defence of um, and not contractors, just because of the scale of events we've had recently, they have had to prioritise um, essentially creating roads that are passable over 
um, the kind of aesthetics, which is a little bit unfortunate. But um, you know, it's everything from um, weeding along side roads and, and marginal strips and roundabouts right through to rubbish, unfortunately, has had to be reprioritised. But it is part of our context. It is something that we are reviewing at the moment and um, looking at how we better better tackle it. It would be nice to think we could tackle it at source, but um, as you say, it's, it's not always um, not always possible. Yeah, can be. Uh, Chair, yes, um, and thank you for that, David. I just would like to acknowledge, please, those, those champions that go out um, and selflessly mm. pick up rubbish, and I see women walking down the Pippawai Straits all by themselves um, in and around Whakatani the other day. I'm getting around a little bit doing the, doing the campaign trail now, and, and, and it's a really, a, you know, I, I have to take my hat off to those people, and we should acknowledge them, please, and, and, um, and, and, and at least try and help them out to, uh, to uh, end their endeavours of uh, volunteers. And I just note one thing. They've all got the same colour here as you and I, Chair, so it's a... Uh, Half your age. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Bas. Keep going, David. Okay. Um, so safety cameras. We've talked about this a bit before, but just, just by way of an update, um, we are well into the new procurement process for our safety camera expansion and transfer from New Zealand Police. Um, behind the scenes before cameras are deployed, there's a whole bunch of work around um, the systems uh, that actually make the camera system work. So uh, we will need a new infringement processing system. Um, we are looking at new policies and processes about how those cameras work. There's a whole lot of law around what you can and can't, can't turn off. Sorry, a little bit of American. Um, in terms of the functions of those cameras, and we're working through those at the moment. David, just pause on that. I just wish it near women. I think this is an area also we can work with the territorial authorities. You're coming the way of the world for all sorts of reasons, but the thing that we're finding is the point that you're making is how do you give access? You know, it's, it's there for safety, but it actually picks up a whole lot of other stuff. How do we get access to the information um, to, to the police? So that they can actually use it because there's a lot, a lot of um, when you the previous conversation about um, rubbish and that sort of thing, you can see the people dumping the stuff. But being able to get that information to somebody. So how do we work together at that local government and central government to make sure that information is available quickly to the police? Thank you. Worship me, Turner. Then we worship me. We struck me, Thank you. Look, I sort of pick up on what uh, Mayor Weber has just talked about, and congratulations to Western Bay Printer. They've probably got the best CCTV camera <laughs> in uh, New Zealand. Session. And so I, I have asked Walker Kotahi, and I probably asked it too early in the piece when they were just getting used to the fact that the police were handing on the responsibility to them. But we are currently putting in place a, a budget to uh, start to catch up to Western Bay around CCTV. And what we, if we need to know is we don't want to double up with Waka Kotahi, um, and so if, but we're not clear in our minds yet what those cameras are they just triggered by speeding uh, a car that's going over the limit, or they are they taking note of any and every car that goes through and hold that information for a potential period of time that then could be useful to the police. So, you know, I completely agree, we'd love to work with you to make sure that we're um, not doubling up on each other. And um, but, but of interest too is that in, with this resource that we're putting aside for CCTV, and we've got to get our head around legally where we can put them as well. But a huge demand from our rural communities now saying, you know, it's not just about the Pakatani Township, they want to have um, safe accesses in and out of their areas so that um, the police can follow up on concerns. So I, I would love, to, I think that's a really great conversation our staff should be having with yours. David, I'll, David, I'll come back to you. Your Worship, Mayor Restra. Yes, yeah, so a very quick question. Um, showing my ignorance, I don't understand the difference between signed and unsigned cameras. So I'd quite like a little bit of clarification, please. Oh, <laughs> sorry, that should say assigned and unassigned oh, cameras. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, no, we, get, we get the artist to sign this other camera. Um, no, that's a fact. Okay, so. Um, yeah, we, uh, the camera network ultimately, when it when it's full, will will have. I think the aim is to have 800 cameras nationally, which is quite significant. And a portion of those will be 
on a pole like that assigned to a location and a portion of them will be mobile unassigned. Um, yes, we are doing some desktop work at the moment on around about 400 sites that we want to, that we think are the optimal sites for us to look at high-risk corridors for um, for speed, for point-to-point, -point, for things like um, uh, poor driver behaviour merging, um, issues where there are high incidents of accidents at roundabouts, um, also looking at seatbelt wearing, as you all know, it's one of the, you know, on the, and cell phone use. We are planning to sit down with road control authority staff and New Zealand police to refine that list and talk about what that what that opportunity presents. So that is um, intended to, to happen. Um, at the moment, our focus is on working through the legislative changes that will require that are required to allow us to use those cameras in the first place. Um, as I understand it, you, you can you can tell what colour somebody's eyes are with these cameras. So they are, you know, they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty high technology. Um, and so, as I said, there's a whole lot of legislative work that we've got to do. Then we are planning to sit down on those 400 and say, hey, guys, what do you think? We think this is a really good place to look at traffic merging. Um, we think this is a great place to look at point-to-point um, -point use on the state highways, for example, so New Zealand police don't have to police those sections. What else would would really useful benefits within the le legal framework be. David, just pause for one moment. Her Worship Mayor Chadwick and Her Worship Mayor Turner, Mayor Chadwick. Uh, thank you. And David, I'm just not sure of your point here about transferring safety cameras. Uh, we have a very big community safety initiative here where we share uh, the forensic evidence. And I think for community safety, that's really important. Um, rather than seeing it as a speed management um, planning process only. Can you give me assurance that we won't lose the sharing of forensic data? Um, Mayor Chadwick, that's part of the conversation that we intend to have with the road control authorities, which is all of you, and police to ensure that that continues. They're called safety cameras deliberately, not speed cameras, because they are focused. We will be focusing on distraction on seatbelts, on driver behaviour, as well as speed. Yeah. It's, it's actually for us, it's often driver identification of, you know, the, the comings and goings into our district. So public yeah. uh, safety is paramount for us, as well as speed management. Thanks. Absolutely. Your Worship, Thank you. Look, just in recent times, you'll remember we had an arson um, at, a, at a local primary school, so considerable damage was done. The description of a vehicle leaving the scene was given to the police. A vehicle meeting that description crossed over the Whakatane Bridge at about the right time that you'd expect it to be there. doesn't read um, number plates. Virtually useless. So I, I guess getting ones that... that that's why I'm quite interested in the fact that we could work well with Waka Kotaki on that. But the other issue for us that I don't think we have any real clear awareness of as a council, while we already own some um, CCTV, we, you know, it's this whole um, asset management 101, the cost of the bill is only a third of the cost of the light. And I, I think we kind of get a sense of what putting in more cameras is going to cost us. But in terms of what, what is the maintenance and ongoing, what is the life of a camera, when, when, how, how soon would we be need to be replacing that or upgrading, all those kinds of questions are really unknown to us and um, have to be part of the budget because, you know, you tend to get a bit focused on, on capital expenditure and, and then just hope that you'll be able to afford the operational costs as they come along. So I'm just wondering if you've got, you know, it might be too early for you too. I'm just oh, wondering. it's a bit early to tell that, to be honest, but let's be, just to be clear, this is a Waka Kotahi investment. We're not expecting that you make an investment. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit early to tell. And it'll, it'll depend on how they where they're deployed as well. Yeah. Going over. Okay. Um, just one network framework. I know we've talked about this before. What I all I want to highlight here is that um, all of the road control authorities have now classified their network using this new framework, and over the next 18 months we will start moving the knowledge that that's come from that or the, the new classifications into um, 
actual use. And so this will be something that we want to um, reflect on a little bit more in detail as we start to do the next regional transport plan because this will influence those investment decisions um, that Councillor Anise was talking about. She's got a hand up. Just pause for a moment. There's worship there, Webber, than Councillor Anise. There's worship. Yeah, that's a, um, a very interesting assumption that uh, the one network which sets road standards when you get into local roads, um, the far rate will not enable local government, in my understanding, to bring its standard of roads up to the one network classification within about a 30 year time frame, let alone do it in a couple of years. And I think um, those that uh, are going to be here next time around to understand that the one network classification, many and it's over 50%, my understanding, rural roads do not meet the one network classification. And to bring that up to standard is it's, it's three waters all over again. Um, so, yes, so yes, I agree with you. Um, this, I suppose, goes to you can't make an investment decision until you understand the scale and scope mm -hmm. of that, and you can't make an investment decision until you understand the standard you want to achieve. And so what this is doing is highlighting gaps in that standard that we want to achieve, no question. Um, it's highlighting similar gaps in the state highway network as well. Um, and there's a very serious conversation for us to have uh, about particularly the maintenance investment in, in the wider network. And we've started that already, as you'll know, with our minister and Minister McAnulty has not been afraid to talk about that as he's done his road trips um, and he's had some very robust feedback. Mm -hmm. So, yes. <laughs> Councillor, please. Thank you. Um, I was just seeking clarification about how different this framework is from the one network road classification because as I understood it, that identified a function of a road and therefore set a desired level of service that that um, road should then meet. Um, but as, as has been noted, that actually hasn't come to pass and we still have a wide variation in standards of levels of service of roads. So, is this identity, is this uh, framework, is this setting levels of service as well, David? And, and will it work in well uh, with the asset management data standards so that we get a good picture of where the, the gaps are in the whole network? So the, 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 the big differences are that the one open framework it accounts for place as well, so the context of place. So it's not just a a local road, it's a local road that passes by a kohanga and a medical centre and a shopping centre and therefore um, we recognise the function as well as the form. It also classifies, or will, we're not quite there yet, but will classify walking and cycling paths um, and those other not road-based investments that we make in, in our transport network and it will also classify um, public transport routes so that will enable our, our investment decisions more clearly, and it links clearly as steers our asset management decisions. Absolutely, that's wonderful. It's no surprise to you that in our local candidates meetings in the Western Bay, we've had a lot of consternation around Katy Katy um, and the bypass, etc., and the function that that road is serving. But you've also got you know lots of um, pedestrians, and and so I, that will help with that sort of issue. Um, okay, driver's licensing improvements, just, just a, a highlight here. Um, we've got a new program in place, um, $16.9 million over the next four years to increase access to driver's licensing. Um, one of the big issues we've got is actually having enough testers um, to do the testing. Um, we are looking at increasing, increasing the ability to do mobile, at least theory and practice, uh, theory and early practical testing so we can go to a place that otherwise um, access is limited to um, and establishing things like group booking. So in theory, if you were from uh, Portski, you could put a bunch of people on a bus, you could group book us a, a whole day and come and deal with the testing. So we try to find some innovative solutions to accessing driver's licensing for, for our communities that, that are disadvantaged in that space. Pause, David, who worship their risk Yes, I'm hoping here, David, that there might be a little bit of um, working together with Mural Task Force for Jobs. Um, there's a lot of concentration on helping young people into uh, licences and so on. 
um, with a real focus on the work coordination programs that are going on. And I'd really like to see that the Ministry of Social um, Development and yourselves uh, are, we, are, we, are working in a joint up um, way for, for this because um, to do it in silo doesn't work and um, especially for the rural places to actually have uh, those two uh, central government agencies on this same page um, helping us benefit the, the people in our areas get uh, more than a learner's licence that they've held for up to 10 years would be really, really, really good. Noted. Keep going, David. Uh, coastal shipping. So we talked about this uh, at the last RTC uh, meeting. It was at that time not confirmed. Um, so we have um, four suppliers now that have been announced for the coastal shipping fund, um, and they're working coastal bulk shipping, Move International, Swire Shipping, and Aotearoa Shipping Alliance. Um, and obviously their um, priority is to work. Um, with us to test those new services and see what kind of um, impact they can can have. We estimate around about 35 million kilometres of truck travel um, every year could be reduced um, just by just by the investment that's been made here, which is quite significant. Mm -hmm. um, so we're in the proposal now. Um, we're in the proposal development stage at the moment of confirming um, just how those uh, investments are going to work. So yeah, big uh, big opportunity. Let's just pause a moment, Councillor Lees. Just with regard to the coastal shipping, I'm thinking about um, emission reduction targets, David, and I know that there's an issue whereby, for, for Toronto particularly, whereby the emissions of a ship that leaves in China and comes, uh, its first point of call might be um, Toronto actually owns the emissions that um, for that whole journey which is, you know, a huge problem for Toronga, um, as you can imagine, when we're looking at reducing emissions. So how how will um, the coastal shipping emissions be managed? Do you know? You no, know, I don't know the answer to that, but I can find out. I think it's very important. Um, thank you. There, yeah, Campbell. Sorry. Just sitting there thinking of what a nonsense. I've never had so much craziness in all my life. How, how will we ever get tied into this? And so, but yeah, so thank you for Jane for sharing that with us. It's mm. just nuts. Keep going, over. Um, safe system audit. So, uh, just to let you know, the safe system audit guidelines are, are now in place. They are out, um, and all of your various um, councils have have been briefed and have copies of them. Um, they replaced the existing road safety audit procedures for, um, and they'll be formalised at the end of this month, actually, I think it's this week. Um, essentially, they're just tidying up um, the safe system that we had in place earlier, clarifying roles, um, clarifying how system assessment and audit functions will be, will be carried out when you're developing. So, you know, we want to build a new cycleway is the safe system order um, so that you can um, have a much more consistent approach to how we're measuring whether these things are safe or not. Um, there's some links at the bottom of the page there for um, virtual training courses, which I highly recommend. I sat through one the other day. Um, and obviously, we're working with your teams on this, so it would be no surprise to your teams. Just pause a moment. Who was it there, Easter? Yeah, sorry to be a nuisance. Um, I don't see that in there. Oh, in, the, in our agenda, that particular oh, slide. Okay. Wonder why. Might have been a last minute update. <coughs> oh, yeah. uh, I'll get that to him in there. Okay. Got a copy there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, now let's talk about Penny. Um, there's an awful lot going on at the moment. And so, just by way of a quick update uh, of the major projects that are going on. So, Takatumi North Link Stage 1. Um, we started construction on the Cambridge Road overbridge. Uh, it's going to be 100 metres long, uh, which is significant. It'll carry one lane in each direction with um, shoulders and footpaths on both sides. Um, piling work probably will take about three months, so we're underway with that at the moment, so it's going to be a little while longer. Further north of the, of the project, um, we're starting piling work on the Wairoa overbridge. That's going to be 140 metres 45 metres, um, and that's a temporary construction bridge while we 
complete the next stage uh, of the of the long term bridge over the Wairua River. Um, Stairway to Wahi to Amokara. So I drove through there yesterday. Actually, um, that's coming along. Um, accepting that there's quite a bit of disruption while that work is, is done. Um, media barrier, um, media barrier completion is middle of 2023 for that one. Um, Omokara to Tapuna. Uh, again, we've reviewed uh, previous investigations into what, and this is to your point, um, Mayor Judy. Uh, we've gone back and reviewed. Uh, what was initially planned for that site based on feedback, made some changes um, uh, to try and minimise the amount of disruption that, that uh, those works will cause when they're in place. Um, so some of the recommendations uh, have been implemented, some, some not, um, but I think a, a reasonably good um, compromise has been reached in that site. So, Taurico enabling works, so we are, we are now delivering the enabling works alongside Tauranga City Council. Detailed design for the improvements is almost complete. Um, they include a roundabout at Redwood Lane, traffic signals at Cambridge Road, which has always been on the cards, and opening up access to Fiori Ave for buses and cyclists. Um, probably consent applications will come just pre-Christmas, just pre um, and we're intending to start construction in um, mid, early mid-2023. Uh, the long-term business case for the long-term State Highway 29 bypass is progressing and will be with the board early 2023, probably in the February meeting. Uh, Hewitt's Road Indicative Business Case is underway. I probably won't talk too much about that, to be honest. That's um, an ongoing, long piece of work that will take quite a bit of work. Um, Bailing making huge progress on bailing. I think um, you will be seeing quite regular, you know, big chunks of infrastructure going on. I think I said at the last RTC, there's a huge amount of work that has gone in underneath that infrastructure and we're finally at the point where the, where the stuff you can't see is finished and now we can start building on top of it. So you'll be seeing quite a bit more progress. Um, and finally, Tauranga Eastern Link Road. So construction of the two interchange projects is underway. Um, drove through there as well um, yesterday, and you really can see the work progressing there. Um, obviously, that's having quite a bit of impact on the on the um, traffic, and we're trying to minimise that, particularly given that it's a toll road and people have an expectation that it will be faster. So doing our best to minimise that as much as possible. Critical pieces of work for the West of Bay. Any comments, anybody? Being done, move on, David. Right, 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 right. So, um, some more projects there Rudra right, Tanai Junction. So, the construction there is um, well underway. Um, we expect that to be completed early next year. Um, Stairway 33 safety improvements. So, we're again expecting early next year to have that completed. Um, we took the minister through there a few weeks ago. Um, with the deputy mayor, um, unfortunately, um, air chat wasn't available, but um, making excellent progress there. The urban speed review, uh, we've just announced that, and so those new speed limits will be in place from Monday the 3rd of October, and the signs will go up overnight before that, so that signs are, are in place the moment that that takes legal effect. Um, State Highway 30 to Awaki, Awakiri to Whakatane, so that this is um, part of the conversation that the interview was raising. Um, we've done the detailed design. We're currently engaging with, consulting with key stakeholders in the wider community, and um, we have had quite a bit of detailed conversation with police about this one, and the team are, I think, I think Jess is actually meeting with um, even today to uh, have a conversation about what um, detailed plans, what the implications of those plans are, what the Whakatane district's plans are in terms of further development and the implications of those, and what can and can't be permanent or temporary. Um, one thing to highlight as part of that design, we've actually put in, um, for you, um, not for you, <laughs> Malcolm, but we've put in pullover bays. Um, to a quite frequent pullover base to acknowledge the issue that one, you've got a lot of rural vehicles that are quite slow, but two, um, if you do need to pull over, you don't want to be stranded in the middle of the road. So that's one of the kind of 
I suppose, new features of these works that have come about literally because of consultation. Just, um, just pause a moment, David. Your Worship, Mayor Chairman. Yeah, thanks, uh, David. And sorry I couldn't be with you with the Minister, but uh, uh, it was a very enthusiastic meeting, apparently. And that's good. Yes. <laughs> great that we see, it's great that we see them so that we can reinforce the big issue for us is uh, phase two and three. It's just too loose to say it'll be triggered by development. I'm just wondering when that trigger happens. Um, because that Eastgate intersection is absolutely critical for us uh, around the airport terminal. And there is growth happening now, and I don't know when that tips over. Is that just, we have to keep nudging it? I think we both have to keep an eye on it, to be honest. Um, it is something the Minister asked us, because we put in this briefing that this would be triggered by growth and he said, what does that mean? Um, and does, does that give a date? And it doesn't give a date. It's, it's essentially triggered by traffic density. Um, I've, I've asked the team to have a wee look at what do we mean by that? Um, because I do think it's an ongoing conversation that we need to have and probably we don't want to be having it with too much gray around it um, going forward. I think we do need to have some, a little bit more certainty than what that provision provides. So I'm with you there. Um, and something that we will work on. Thank so you. And the <clears throat> go on, Your Worship. Then I'll come and go. No, no, no that's fine. I, it, I worry about an incoming council having the, you know, picking up the advocacy of this uh, because it's critical and um, they will continue to pursue it. But uh, the growth out there is huge, enabled by the infrastructure fund, perversely. So it should have yes. happened at the same time, but there you go. Support of her worship, you know, as I said to you pre-meeting, David, that entrance and exit into the Rotary Airport is an absolute death trap. Yes. You know, it is. Cars and people hiring rental cars and tourists, and they got logging trucks coming at them from both sides, and you know, totally you support you, your worship. Thank Keep you. Keep going, David. Oh, sorry, David. This pause minute. This worship there, Campbell. Yeah, David, I'm just, I um, um, apologise if I've preempted and gone a bit quicker than this, but um, over, while we've been campaigning around the area, um, and particularly the bridge, comes up all the time, lots of inquiries about the bridge. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to just ha have it clarified about who would be paying for the bridge, because there's a whole lot of uh, um, can, uh, uh, thoughts that, the ratepayers of Bokotani would have to pick up the bridge. And the other one that is really dear to my heart is the Pikatai Bridge. The condition of the Pikatai Bridge is absolutely appalling. Uh, we fought vigorously around these tables with uh, Mayor, Mayor Forbes and Mayor, Mayor um, um, uh, Bond about whether we wanted to have a concrete um, topping on it. And we were told by the experts who actually dumped all the wood uh, on in the wrong place, and it all got washed out to Pagari in the flood. Um, that having a wooden wooden um, deck was going to fail, and it has absolutely failed. It's it's a, it's worse than it ever was. And I've, I've used that bridge for probably sixty years myself. Uh, just just a bit of a clarification. Number one, who would be paying for a second bridge? And the Picatay Bridge, please, we can have something done about that. So a second bridge is not in the NLTP and probably won't be in the next one, to be honest. Um, who would pay for it would be a conversation mm -hmm. for the NLTP. And my estimation is we would just follow the normal funding rules around um, around that. In terms of Pekitahi Bridge, um, interesting that you raised that because at the Waikato Regional Transport Committee, I was able to confirm that the bridge, the timber deck, on the Hikawai Bridge, uh, which has suffered from some similar issues, is now being replaced with a steel deck, uh, and we'll be actually starting that in a couple of weeks. So, um, yes, acknowledge those timber decks have got some challenges, um, and in the same way that the Hikawai Bridge, um, in in reviewing its lifespan and normal maintenance program, we've decided to replace that with a steel bridge. Um, we will be looking at all of the bridges in the network that have been That's not a promise to say that anything will happen quickly, but it is um, there's a balance between the maintenance cost and the capital cost of replacing um, those things that we get to strike. 
and then just pause for one moment. Your Worship, Mayor Reese. Yes, I just want to um, be supportive of um, Mayor Cal uh, Campbell's uh, comments, and I do recall that the money that was used to fix the uh, Pikitahi Bridge, um, all three councils said that's a waste of money, put it towards a two-lane bridge, uh, bring it, bring forward creating a two-lane bridge there because of the increase in freight, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those conversations have been um, probably the whole time that I've been in local government, so that's nine years' worth. Um, and, again, those are, the I think, the essential things that are not quite... That, that's the, um, the disconnect between the local um, need and knowledge... Um, and not being listened to by the um, waka kotahi around um, what is the better way of using the money. And I, I remember also on those same conversations, there was $8 million being used on the straight roads with the uh, medians and the side barriers, um, which again what came up for... Um, contesting from the three district councils and we all um, wondered why and the last comment before your time David I admit the last comment we got was well um, if you object to it that much we won't spend the money there that type of conversation um, won't occur again I don't think it's worse up there Campbell I thank you chair look uh, just just to put put my colleagues into the picture here and, and I don't have to tell Mayor Gary Weaver, because he's, he's been in transport all his life and he knows a little bit about the exacerbation of the roading network that actually is um, created through car rail, the car rail mills. And um, so logging logging out of, out of the East Cape now is, is huge and, and that's having a huge effect on on the, on the Waimane Gorge because everything get, gets funneled out that way. And um, yeah, that, that, so that, that, was, that was why the reason that I wasn't trying to muscle in on on Mayor uh, Mayor Turner's patch at all, but it just is a concern. So thank you. This conversation's taking off, David. Um, <laughs> Her Worship, Mayor Turner. Oh, no, no, look. I, I, th I think okay. the, great, the greatest strength for us in Whakatani has been the fact that now we have the Eastern Bay Mayors all supporting the, the, the need for um, either a second bridge or something, something that will, will work. And, um, you know, We've even had I've even had discussions quite recently with people saying what would what would what would bring our project up the list? Do we need to find some funding that we help contribute to that? And um, I, I don't know what the answer to that is, but there's, that's how desperate people are. They're looking at how we could um, find a way to support the, the project. Keep going over. So well, just I think to be clear, one of the things I asked team when they decided to replace the bridge at Hikawai was, it's a single lane bridge. What would the cost be? Why don't we just replace it with a double lane bridge? Get on with it. And they said, well, the cost will be 10 to 20 times as much. We don't have funding in the LTP. And we can't protect the funding we have got to, to replace the deck beyond this funding round. So but bluntly, we do this or we lose the money and we stay with a timber deck and we don't get a double land bridge because the money doesn't exist. So the challenge for us collectively in the next RLTP is to really, really clearly reflect those priorities and convince each other and then, you know, nationally that that is our priority. What I would say in terms of a second bridge argument, for example, that needs, and I know that, that um, Steph is, is leading some work around this because I'm involved in it, is that it needs to be supported by really good spatial planning that says this is where our development's going to be, yeah. this is what it looks like, these are our priorities, therefore a second bridge here makes sense. And I think the other thing I would say is that our recent experience with um, our resilience challenges on the network has highlighted that that's got to be part of that conversation around that spatial planning. Yes. So absolutely up to be part of the conversation. Absolutely think we need to do that as a regional transport committee. Um, and, and I'm, as you know, absolutely happy to 
represent that in every way I can once we have come to a decision that we all say, yes, that's our priority as a regional transport company. Okay. Um, please notice the last slide. So just a quick snapshot. Uh, I, I, the team pulled these together and I thought they were really, really useful. This is the state highway maintenance summary for 21-22, so at the end of our 22 year, which um, August. And it just gives you a sense of the scale. So we've spent more money on the chat on the network than we ever have before in Bay of Plenty. Um, and when you start to look at some of those numbers, it's it's um, phenomenal. So state highway maintenance spend 45 million, local road maintenance spend that's um, Council's and what we say collectively 65 million. Well over 110 million dollars of investment in the in the transport network in the bay. Um, scary figures. We're then having a conversation about much of the not, network not being <laughs> not being great. So uh, I think it gives us a sense of yes, there's a significant amount of investment. There's a lot going on. There's a lot that needs to continue to go on, and, and we really need to reflect the priority of maintaining you know, and bringing that through. One of the things we're talking about with um, Ministry of Transport as part of the funding review is at the moment the way we fund maintenance is maintenance. Is, is, is doesn't include improvement. And so when we are, so for example, if I go back to the last slide, um, that, uh, that's Moti River where we're um, sort of 35 washed away. So maintenance would have us bring that back to the standard it was, not to improve it. And so that's one of the things we're talking about with the Ministry of Transport is, hey, while we're doing this work, we could make some improvements. Um, wouldn't it be good to have some improvement built into the expectation around um, what we do when we do our maintenance? Uh, and I think that would be a big step forward. Um, at a national level, um, we are looking at currently, we did 2,200 kilometres of lane kilometres of State Highway. We're looking to increase that to 2,400 next year. Uh, so we are gradually growing there, and that will be reflected in the work that we do um, in the Bay. But I just thought that's a really good slide to show you the kind of scale of work and the nature of work that's been done as part of that maintenance program. Your Worship, your best friend. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you, Chair. Yes, as I was dodging the huge potholes that were going to take out my wheels today on State Highway 2, um, it made me uh, reflect on uh, my predecessor, uh, Mayor John Forbes' uh, comments always to us in our district was, if you fix the smaller uh, pothole at $500, it's not going to cost $50,000 the next time if it's left for two or three years. And I think the spend reflects how badly our roads had deteriorated. Oops since the change of the, um, uh, the, 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 site, the truck of the, the weight and size of the trucks. But also um, it reflects the huge increase in the freight that is moving through from Gisborne and within the Eastern Bay of Kenti through to, to this way. Um, and quite like to have that slide as well if we could have that sent through. That's really oh, yeah, helpful information. Thank you. Wrap up comments, mate. Um, wrap up comment. I would simply say, as we move into elections, I would like to thank you all for um, for these meetings, but also for the work that you've done with me individually over the last little while. I'm, it's nearly two years that I've been in this role. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, I know. Uh, and um, yeah, you've all been. You've all been a pleasure to work with, so uh, I wish you all good luck as you go into the elections. And for those of you that are retiring, obviously I'll get my chance to say goodbye to your former retirement, but um, good luck to you all. And I look forward to the next Regional Transport Committee. And you're a voting member of this committee. You're happy to move the receipt of your report? I move the receipt. Of Second of the Bush, the attorney, I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against carried. I intend to take a 15 minute break for morning tea. What are your travel arrangements like, Angus? <coughs> You're the next one on stage. Yeah, no. You're here, wonderful. Um, Councillor Dennis, Councillor Brunning, I invite you to, if you'd like to take a seat next to 
the attorney rather than be in the back and Councillor Brunning, if you'd like to be your wish be a chadwick today, there's a seat over here for you. So you're more than welcome to come up and join us. So we'll take a 15 minute break everyone and we'll recommence at five to eleven.
Welcome back, everybody, and to those joining us. Uh, the next is Kiwi Rail and Angus Hodgson, who is the manager of policy and shareholder uh, for Kiwi Rail. And uh, can I formally say a very warm welcome to you, Angus? I know this is the day the tent's coming down, but it's great to have you here. <laughs> Um, and getting you here was a long gestation. We all know that, don't we, Mayor Campbell? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but it finally took the intervention of the Minister to um, have Kiwi Rail at the table. But um, some of the leaders may wish to make some comment on that uh, as we get into your presentation. But they were particularly keen and felt there was a huge vacuum at the table about you guys here. So good to have you here. So it's all yours. Good to have you here, Angus. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me. I've now said this. Uh, I think it is on. Oh. Um, I've said this every single time, but it is always a pleasure to be here. It's good to be connected in with the, the work you guys are doing. Uh, the way that we see this is that uh, the work that we do on the Golden Triangle is just so critical for everything that we're about, but also for the flow of freight in New Zealand and everything else. Uh, so it's just really great to be connected and I also said right at the very start that uh, given we were right at the beginning of the first year of Rail Program, that uh, we would, I'll bring us closer, uh, that I'll give you an update after year one on, on how things went. Um, so this is me doing that. Uh, and if, in, a, in a future RTC, I may well come back and give you some updates on some of the major projects or other work that we're doing. I was saying to Councillor Nees uh, during the break that we're doing an indicative business case on fleet decarbonisation. It's a really key bit of work for us around long-term procurement for future locomotives and all that sort of thing. Um, so quite a, quite a key bit of work, uh, probably a good, good one for us to do with you guys early next year. So, uh, as a refresher, um, what is the Rail Network Investment Programme? It's just a subset of the uh, NLTP. Uh, it focuses in on the foundational parts of the Rail Network. Uh, how does it fit in terms of the uh, wonderful parlance of government uh, planning and funding? Uh, arrangements. So the government sets their strategy for the rail plan. It was released just last year in April. Uh, our board then responds to that by preparing a, an investment program that aligns to their strategic priorities. Uh, we then put that in front of Waka Kotahi, a different part of uh, Waka Kotahi than David's, uh, do a big thorough assessment of it, give the Minister of Transport some advice on it. Uh, and in the end, the ANA exists once the Minister of Transport approves. So uh, ultimate decision rights around funding all those arrangements that with him. Uh, in terms of how it's funded, uh, just with co covering that because it can sometimes be a, a source of public contention. Uh, so we do receive some funds from the NLTF. Uh, if you think about it this way, we have about between 400 to 500 million or so per year in the ANA. About 120 to 170 of that is funds set aside through the NLTF. The balance of that is met from a contribution that we pay uh, and a track user charge based on the revenues we get from our freight activities. Uh, and the rest of that, the balance of that, is funded by the government directly uh, by topping up the NLTF uh, in their budgets. Uh, how does it work in the wonderful, confusing, ever unclear uh, world of uh, transport planning? 
Um, there you go. That's the rail pan I just talked about. The middle piece there is our uh, ARNIP. The rail pan is supposed to be a signal that uh, feeds back through to you guys and your RLTPs. Now that it's a, a part of the system, it means that when your RLTPs are being developed, that now in future um, rail plans being updated will be responsive to your RLTPs as well. Uh, it's part of the government policy statement, so it all goes there in that fantastic circular loop uh, called transport planning. I never know if that's a clear diagram or not, so please give me feedback. Uh, in terms of what's in it, so uh, the ARNIP, the way that we talk about it is that it's three years and 10 years. Uh, so the, the approved ARNIP is a 10 year program, but the program of work that we do is always in a, in a three year forward looking uh, way. So within our ARNIP, uh, we are funded through two uh, NLT activity classes. The main one is the Rail Network Activity Class. That is for all of the foundational work for the network. I just want to draw your attention there to some of those numbers. The middle one is 790 million across this three-year period. The three-year period is around 1.3 billion. Uh, the reason why I'm drawing your attention to that is because that's the biggest number. And the biggest number there is on renewals. It's not on maintenance and operation. It's not on network improvements, which are relatively and deliberately modest. And the reason why that number on renewals is so big is because we are going through a major program of catch up. So uh, we aren't there yet. Our ambition is to have a resilient and reliable rail network and a resilient and reliable national network, not just parts of it. Uh, in order to get there, there's a lot of parts of the network which need to be picked up. Uh, the good news is for you guys is that because you're on the Golden Triangle, triangle with all of that uh, incredible freight volumes, uh, what we're really trying to do, if you think about it this way, is lift the rest of the network up to this type of standard that exists on the Golden Triangle. Angus, just pause for one moment. Is worship there with it? Angus, it is great to have you around the table with your colleague across the table, who I hope you're really good friends with. <clears throat> the concern we have in, in this group is the 30-year network plan and and the and we've raised this in here the track user charges there is a perverse problem there that if you're trying to make yourself profitable by pushing up the track user charges you're forcing people off rail on the road and and we are we are <clears throat> asking yourselves and Mboka Kotahi to seriously take a long hard look at this together so going out 30, 50 years, are we better to put the money into the rail and sacrifice some of those uh, routes where we want trucks to go and look at the inland ports and that sort of thing? So that, we're just urging you to take a slightly higher look when you're thinking about that track user charges. You can have some perverse outcomes out there which cut across, and that's why we desperately wanted you at the table to understand those dynamics that one could harm the other. And, and the more we push from rail to road, the more we'll push up emissions. Yeah, I, mean, I take that point and it's probably worth parking there for a moment. So, I mean, the, the principal position around the track user charge was that uh, users of the rail network and beneficiaries of taxpayer investment would also be a contributor towards it as well. Um, and saying that, there has, there has been and has to be a consideration around affordability for the end consumer being our customers. Uh, so that total investment per year is about $50 million. Spread across our customers is obviously a portion of that. Um, so that is, it is not the same as the road user charges where the rates are a little bit higher and more, more sort of deliberately set on a cost recovery basis. We set a nominal fee and then spread it across our customers. Um, so far, all of our customers have been accepting of that because beyond that $50 million, there's numbers like that. There is there is large yes in the level of investment that the taxpayer is putting into us. So we feel it's, it's our duty and our obligation to be contributing towards the NLCF because in the end our rail operations uh, are beneficiaries of it. And all other rail users at the moment, I should note, do pay towards the maintenance of the network through their access agreements with us. So it's, it's a standard arrangement, totally take the point around affordability, but um, you know, people are getting something for this. They're getting an improved standard of network. Uh, they're getting better reliability around how our services operate. And in the end, we think that's more likely to keep them wanting to use us. So it's an interesting policy uh, discussion. Angus, just pause a moment. Um, Her Worship, Mayor Chadwick, then Glenn Crab. <coughs> Mayor Chadwick, somewhere around here. Yep. You um, thank yep. you. And, and nice to see you, Angus, though I can't see you, but that's all right. Um, 
I'm totally <laughs> with the Mayor Weber here, and um, and I think all of us agree that we've got to move from uh, the heavy investment into road into rail. And I don't, you know, in your categories, I don't see new investment and in new networks. Um, and, and I wonder about a budget bid, but you might be a, about to tell us that on your next um, presentation because, um, and you know what we've been saying, and I, I hear you using the same word of the golden triangle, and we call it a diamond. Um, so I, I'm really tired of hearing that Waikato, Tauranga, Auckland link and think you have to look wider than that. But I hope it's in in the rest of your presentation, Angus, because we're great fans for investment in rail. Thank you. Uh, nice to know the diamond language. I wasn't familiar with that. Um, it, it isn't in this presentation, but I can come back. Uh, so, and, and I just want to be clear about what I mean there. So we have lots of different funds uh, from the government. The main one is our foundational investments through the ARNIT, but we also have uh, direct investment through the New Zealand Upgrade Program, um, the artist formerly known as Provincial Growth Fund, now Kanoa, uh, and other funds like that. Um, so in terms of the major network improvements, that so far there's been a decision by government to keep those major project investments sitting outside of the, of the ARNIT, and the yeah. network improvements are pretty modest, and that's deliberate. Um, uh, in time, uh, our view would be that all of those major projects would be done through the ANA because if we if we want to keep things simple and we want to keep it nice and responsive to our LTPs and all of the sort of strategic ambitions that you guys have, uh, there should be one process, not multiple. Mm -hmm. uh, the point I'm trying to make is just that the level of investment required at the moment and the amount of work that we can do in this immediate three-year pro um, program has to be focused on lifting the standard up before you can go and do all those work, uh, bits of work around growth. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding that, we are doing major work on both. So um, just to make it really clear to people, we're talking about things like extending electrification, Papakura to Pukekohe, that's currently on um, the way. In fact, work construction just started a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're talking about building the third main line in Auckland, uh, building the rail spur. I mean, Chadwick, you mentioned new, new lines. Uh, there is a, a rail spur business case currently in front of government uh, to uh, build a connection from the North Auckland line over to Northport. So there are major bits of work occurring across the network in addition to the ARNA, but my presentation is just focused on the ARNA. Chat with yep. your hands up, is it a supplementary? Yeah. It's just one other, su it's, it's another supplementary if you don't mind, Mr Chair. It, it, uh, if we are reliant on Kano, uh, the Economic Development Fund, that's now only 200 million. So it's it's actually underwhelming if business cases have to come through to get um, light rail from here to from Rotorua to Auckland. Uh, we'd never get that level of investment through the Economic Growth Fund. It's just worth noting, and we know how to we know how to get money, but uh, for an aspiration, and I think that's that's something that we've got to make quite clear to Minister Nash as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think there's, there's a point there for everyone to take, which is uh, if you're thinking about how you're getting funding in for the rail network, the message to people should be put it through the ARNA. Uh, don't make use of all of the other funds because they are small, their own processes and all of those sort of things. So one, one clear system is the ARNA. That's the great benefit yep. of incorporating us into the NLTP process now. I'll just pause a moment, Angus. Uh, this is the batting order. Glenn Crowther, Your Worship, Mayor Turner, then Commissioner Selwood. By way of introduction, Angus, uh, we have an environmental sustainability advisor, and that's Glenn, who you would know. So, Glenn, the floor's yours. Now, just um, reinforcing Mayor Weber's point, um, I think a critical aspect is the pricing, like the carbon pricing, which the Climate Commission is going to address. It doesn't currently look at a total cost or, you know, a, no. something else based costing. And that came up in a recent meeting with um, the Western Bay, Tauranga and uh, Regional Council representatives and others in a meeting with Moose Shore. And the amount of embedded carbon in the roading network and the rail network and the maintenance programs. And if that is not factored in, I think you'd get some distorted outcomes of that rail investment program. So bottom line is, it would all push rail investment to go further and <coughs> if, if the total cost was incorporated. I totally agree. Um, I was saying to, to Glenn Council and Ezra in the break that uh, I think next year when we've finished our indicative business case on 
fleet decarbonisation, I should come back and give you a, a proper briefing on how that's going. Um, but I can tell you right now, as a not to preempt it, given our board hasn't approved it, but uh, the, the, the impact of pricing signals, particularly through the ETS, price on carbon, uh, is, is pretty significant as you um, skip forward a few a few decades in terms of freight volumes and mode shift from road to rail. Um, absolutely critical, so point taken. Who worship me turn? I think Commissioner Selwood, me turn. I just briefly, I just thinking some other things that we look at in local government and the fact that we've, particularly with the free water reform, we have an opposition party saying they will repeal it. Um, if there's a change of government, is is do you feel like you've got multi-party support for the direction that you're heading in? No, I feel we've got good relationships with all of our political parties. We talk regularly with the National Party, with the Green Party, with uh, with all of the parties of government. Um, National uh, has, a, has a current policy, which is to take rail out of the NLTF. Um, so uh, in principle, that wouldn't be inconsistent with us, right? So what, what they aren't saying is that uh, they will take us out of the planning system. Actually, what they're saying is that, that integration is sensible, that the need for long-term integrated planning across your freight network and your passenger network is necessary. So I think they've got the, we would certainly be agreeing with them on that. Uh, in terms of taking rail out of the NLTF, the NLTF is paid for rail for as long as I can remember through um, the passenger networks in Auckland and Wellington. So yeah, that would be a, quite a, a change in approach. Um, so we'll, we'll keep having that conversation with them. Uh, but for, for context as well, right, because I mean, rail does often get held up as quite a heavily political piece. Last national government put $4.4 billion into the network during nine years. Uh, current government is about $8.6 billion. Uh, about 2.7 of that is investment to one off to renew all of our commercial assets, being the locos and the wagons. Uh, so the difference between the two, um, they are big numbers and they matter. They absolutely matter. But actually, we we tend to see pretty good investment since Key Rail was uh, was was bought back. And by the benefit of these renewals, I think whoever does end up uh, inheriting the government when things do change, um, they'll they'll have a better network than they did once upon a time. So it would be harder to harder to knock it back. Morning, Commissioner Selwood. Good morning, and uh, thanks for the presentation. And I think it underlines for me uh, what has been a fairly consistent theme through our discussions this morning, uh, starting with the Local Government New Zealand letter uh, to uh, ministers around the inadequacy of our transport investment funding process, which is now not only inadequate, it, it's now so complex uh, with all of these separate pots of money um, that, that it becomes very hard to administer, and you highlight that in your presentation as well. Um, my question really relates to, to that issue of funding and the extent to which Kiwi Rail have an input into wider rail decisions uh, and the allocation of, of funding for transport. Um, and I'm thinking specifically about the, the current government's proposal for a $15 billion plus uh, investment in light rail in Auckland, whilst the heavy rail network is really struggling across the country to um, maintain its existing network, let alone um, you know provide for the future. And in the context of a, a discussion about how best we fund and allocate total transport um, in New Zealand, what role, if any, does Kiwi Rail have in that discussion? Very little is the answer to that question. Light, light Rail has some involvement with our corridor and our involvement there is making it available and we all have some other lands made available to us to preserve our corridor. Um, we're involved in the uh, Auckland Programme business case for the future of all of their transport needs. So we're part of the discussion, uh, decisions as to whether or not Light Rail go ahead will happen without us. Keep going, Angus. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so just the next slide, um, oh, this is working. Better here, Amanda? Checking on a few bit more. Yeah. Maybe Commissioner Selwood and Mia Chadwick are watching a fantastic presentation and <laughs> skip ahead, but we're not. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just stop and start as well. We'll just pause for a couple of minutes. Amongst yourselves. Thank you. 
Recommit. As is evident from my um, having to go back so many slides, my, te my technology approach is to just keep pressing the same button. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and this is, as I say, the ANIP is we're funded through two activity classes. One is the Rail Network Fund, which is uh, focused across the entire network, uh, but we also receive funds through the PTI activity class, which you'll all be incredibly familiar with, uh, and that is for specific improvements for early Auckland and Wellington metros. Uh, again, that you'll, you'll note there as you cast your eye down those bullet points, what's being described there and the components, uh, the sort of foundational necessary stuff that you need in order to um, develop up there. So it's the, you can't get growth without having a good train control system, for example. So how did year one go? Uh, it, was, it was a good year, uh, despite some pretty major disruptions. So uh, we uh, managed to progress most of the work in terms of our planning. Uh, we got a hell of a lot of work done uh, addressing all of the underinvestment from, from previous years. Uh, 197 additional staff in the first year. I, I think last time I, when I made this point to the Waikato folks, I just sort of blithely went past it. And then David made the point to me afterwards that 197 people recruited in one year is actually a major deal. It is a major deal. It's a huge achievement. Uh, we need more. So uh, if you are seeing anybody, I know one of our people here in Tauranga, uh, when she goes out to do her supermarket grocery shopping, she makes a point of stopping and asking the person behind and in front of them if they're looking for a job because we've got them. So anyone who's interested, please come and have a chat with us. Uh, completely, I can send you to exactly the right person in your area. A uh, lovely man called Simon. Uh, so uh, in terms of the the, the, the next bit of, bit of work, uh, sorry, I should park there. Um, we're well ahead in terms of planning for the next couple of years. That, that matters, and I really want to emphasise this point because in previous years, we have been very much just what is in front of us, deal with that, respond to it. Whereas what the ARNIP is enabling is much longer term horizons in our planning, dealing with a, a national asset in the way that you'd expect a national asset to be dealt with. Uh, so it's worth, worth acknowledging a huge chunk of the work that happened in ARNIP year one is actually been planning for ARNIP's year four, five, six, seven, seventeen, and 20. Uh, and then the other element to it is related to that on asset management maturity, which um, Commissioner Sell would, uh, would know all about. Um, but, you know, when you're looking at things just in front of you, you're having a quick look at the bridge, you're making sure that it's in the right spe um, spec, and then you're moving on to the next project. Whereas at the moment, our planning on those things is do it once, do it right, and then you don't have to look at them again for a much longer period. And it, uh, there's, there's quite a mind shift, um, because when you're talking about QRL employees who are really fantastic, been with us for a long time, um, for them to be able to shift into what they've always wanted to be doing has actually been, you know, required some changes in process and, and changes in approach. So um, yeah, a lot of work that's gone on there, which just want to acknowledge the team on that for. Uh, in terms of the challenges, and this is why I say disruptions, incredibly unusual year entirely attributed to COVID. I don't need to tell people sitting in Tauranga near the port of Tauranga about how big of an impact that has had. A good example of this is that our rail shipment, which was critical for us doing most of the program in year one, arrived months later than it was expected. So you cannot go and do uh, replacement of the rail track if you don't have the bits of steel on it. Mm -hmm. um, but the good news is because we're well uh, better planned and because of the benefits of the SANA, we just managed to reprioritise other bits of work that were on the program for further down the line in the, in the next few years. And that re-sleepering program, we overperformed there by about 20%. So we sent up our folks, said, well, we've got those assets, we've got the materials in place, you're here, so let's go and do that instead. Uh, and what have we learned from that? We've learned from that, given we don't know how long our supply chain disruption is going to be, we're putting in our material orders much earlier than we'd otherwise been planning uh, and increasing our on-hand inventory. So there's good sensible stuff going on there just to try to make sense of what's going on. Uh, in your area, so uh, I'm, I'm always slightly just, I need to go in front of David next time because he always has much better graphics with much bigger numbers because the road network's longer. But, <laughs> um, um, so 6.5 kilometres of rerail happened in the CNI area. So um, that's that's very plenty. It's Waikato and it's uh, the other parts of the country there. That's the way that we've split up the, the network. 
um, of re-rail, 4.5, eight new turnout renewals, six level crossing renewals, 18 kilometres of fibre telecommunications and eight projects for each implementation. Um, what I actually want to draw your attention to there, the first thing is, is that those numbers are relatively low. Why is that? It's because uh, the portion of the network that you can see on that map that's in lovely orange, that being the primary routes, uh, is most of the network in the CNI hub, and you guys are actually the the the, uh, the diamond to use um, a borrow a chat chat prism, the diamond of the network. Uh, we were trying to lift everyone else to be up to the same spec, so you don't need to do quite as much re-railing or re-sleeping of the network that's already in pretty good condition. Uh, so. Point one. Point two was uh, that biggest number there on 18 kilometres of fibre. What we have been doing is uh, kicking off all of those bits of infrastructure work that support the network that you, uh, in previous years, you might have deferred it for a bit longer, whereas we're saying actually those underlying systems for the network are trying to do it. Let's just pause for a minute. That's worship there, Weber. And, and, it would be, and it's really helpful to have you here. The Kaimai Tunnel, we keep on hearing, um, you know, the drivers have to wear face masks, and that does all sorts of things because of the CO2 in there. So why don't you electrify it? I think if you could dispel that myth, would be quite helpful. So yeah. what's 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 the benefit of electrifying through the tower in terms of increasing capacity on the on the line? You know, is, is it real or is it imagined? Uh, so electrification isn't so much a capacity on the network question. Electrification is an emissions and um, preferred technology consideration. Um, what do I mean by that? What I mean is. Uh, because we're doing that indicative business case, we know that it's almost certainly going to conclude that it's a good idea to do electrification and it's a good idea to do it. I won't say golden triangle, uh, but it's a good idea to do it in the areas where the volumes are highest along the NIMT. Uh, so that would mean probably going down from Pukekohe, which we're extending to at the moment from Pukekohe, all the way down to Hamilton. Key benefit of that is that the electrified Auckland network suddenly has a connection to Hamilton. So from a passenger perspective, that would be a, a great benefit. When you go further from Hamilton all the way out to Tauranga, uh, depending on the type of locomotive you get, if you're going to get a standard electric locomotive, you absolutely have to electrify every single bit of it. But if you get a uh, kind of technology which is pretty well available, pretty good technology, pretty strong locomotives, um, we have called tri-mode, uh, which is run on overhead, charges a battery, and if the battery runs out, there's a diesel generator just to make sure it's got enough juice. Um, then if you're looking at a bit of technology like that, you don't need to go and do full electrification across uh, the, the ECMT portion to Tauranga. You do partial electrification to make sure that charge is, is sufficient. Uh, the second element there is what's the right timing for when you do that? Well, timing needs to be before you buy the locomotives, so you've got a decade or so, um, and timing needs to be staged in the right kind of way where, uh, I'd say, for the primary tunnel in particular, uh, Mr. Muldoon, when he was saying this to Mr. Muldoon, when he set up the Kaimai Tunnel, um, I don't know if you thought about it at the time, but uh, there's certainly enough room for us to put overhead lines into the Kaimai Tunnel if you needed to. So that would mean you wouldn't be running diesel through. Uh, in terms of face masks, um, uh, people in locomotive, in locomotive engineers who drive the chains, they're at the front of the train. Diesel's behind them. Yeah, yeah we've got some <laughs> sort of supplementary. Hopefully, the minute I can quick get that word for word, because I think if you give it to the next regional land transport committee, I'd say three days of useless conversation. You know, it is that that is specifically what they need to know because they need to understand they are not trained engineers. Um, when they don't, you know, Kiwi Rail not the answer. We don't need to help them with our engineering skills. I'll see you, Worship. Keep going, Angus. Uh, right, in terms of how we performed against our KPIs, um, so uh, I pulled out the key key KPIs. Uh, I have attempted uh, to write them in plain language because um, we just talked about the rail engineers. I try to keep up with them and I have to admit I'm not uh, fully across all of those, all of the, the wonderful detail that we've got. The key, mess, the key thing that we're trying to do is to reduce the number of temporary speed restrictions. We put on temporary, temporary speed restrictions in the network uh, when things aren't up to spec. Uh, and it has a big impact on us because it means that we're slower than we otherwise should have been. Uh, and our customers need us to be equipped because we need to be turning up on time, 
making sure there's good that time slots uh, at, at either end of the line to be able to unload and, and load more on. So temporary speed restrictions are something we're absolutely trying to reduce. Uh, and we did, we did pretty well. So average route within targets on the priority routes uh, of 80, uh, 80, more than 80%. Um, in terms of track quality index, uh, that's the one that's always the hardest to explain because it has very technical meanings and there's lots of very specific subsets on very specific subsets of each bit of line. Um, but the way that I describe it is exactly what's written there, which is the proportion of the track that's an optimal alignment with the design specification. So yes, there'll be a curve in a track where it's designed. If there's a curve in a track where it's not designed, that's where you have to have a TSR. Uh, so we want to have uh, much better arrangements going on there with our TQI. And the good news is in the CNI, we've pretty much done that. I know uh, for the benefit of the Mayor and, and Deputy Mayor of uh, Kawado, it says that the Mutapata line is just outside of the target. Um, there was a specific subset of one part of the network which was just out, uh, and it's a way that we aggregate it up because it's all percentages and you can't do that on different lots and lots of different bits of line. Uh, either it met the percentage or it didn't, and in that case it didn't, so uh, we just report it that way. Um, it, does, it does work, there's no safety or, or problem issues there. Uh, next one is on heat 40, so uh, we have a network, it's steel, it's sitting out in the open air. Um, in, in, in the winter it's cold and in the summer it's hot, so you need to de-stress the network to make sure that it's got room to, to move and expand and contract and all of those sorts of things. So getting that work done properly is, is absolutely core to good maintenance. So uh, both of those are achieved. Um, you get people running up. I don't know what's happening with that. Um, the next one is just um, some nice volume measures. So in terms of NTKs, which is uh, our, our key piece of the volumes that go on our, on our network, uh, so 1.1 billion was shifted uh, uh, of net tonne kilometres in FY22. Uh, oh, sorry, 4.1 altogether. Uh, and in the Bay of Plenty, 0.5 of that, 4.5 billion. Uh, so pretty pretty large numbers going on here. That's the key point I'm trying to make. Uh, uh, National road share. So uh, one of our key targets in the ARDA from FY20, which is when we had 12% of uh, the freight task, was to get it up to 14% by FY30. We're at 13.4%. So things are shifting in the right direction. Uh, what's ahead in terms of planning? So lots and lots and lots. Um, I'm not going to run through every single item there. All I wish to note is that when I gave this presentation to Waikato, uh, that font was really small. I'm just really pleased to see that I can read it, and I hope you can too. If you can't, look forward to it in your inbox later on today. A uh, couple of key points. So uh, a lot of the work that's going on is the stuff that you might notice it when you drive past, and the next day it's all disappeared and you've forgotten all about it, but it's the sort of thing that that is just absolutely essential. So I talked about the ducting of 18 kilometres of telecommunication infrastructure. Uh, that, that stuff's going to put us in good stead for decades. So that's the type of work that's going on at the moment. Uh, another example is around culverts. So, uh, you know, when you're having to prioritise your funding, if there's not quite enough, uh, some of the things that get pushed in a bit further is how, how, how often you can replace those culverts that sit underneath it. Now, it matters particularly in places like the Waikato where you're on peaty land. Um, you know, if you've got water that gathers and it doesn't flow properly, uh, and you can, you know, when you think about what a rail network is, it's a bunch of stones with some timber or concrete sleepers and some rail running over the top of it. So when the ground is moving underneath it, that has a big impact. And if you've got bumps in the road, it slows it down, and the rail, sorry, it slows it down. So getting good water management is just absolutely critical. So that's where a huge amount of the investment is going. And, uh, and I've picked out that example there because it's in your region. Uh, and here's another. So in terms of what's what's coming up in front of us, that's a bridge between Tepuki and Papamoa just down the road from here. It's going to be completely rebuilt. That's the, I, I, I hesitate to make the, I don't want to make the point here that every single one of our bridges looks like that, but a hell of a lot of them do. Uh, and they won't be in the future. So there's some, some great stuff ahead of us. That's the end of the ARNA presentation. Uh, I've taken the message here that people are interested in getting a briefing when we've done it on the split decarbonisation business case. So I will do that. Uh, also taking the message that uh, those other major project investments that we've got through New Zealand Upgrade Program and other funders that you're interested in those as well. So I will do that as well. Well done, Angus. Um, Councillor Nees, then we Councillor Nees. Thank you, Angus. I see you had a KPI around uh, upgrades of vehicle crossings. Um, we've had 
conversations in the past about deaths um, on level crossings, and I was just wondering whether you have key KPIs around that, or do they sit in the road to zero because a lot of them are roads crossing rail? Uh, they, they sit with both of us. Yeah, and there's there's interesting terminology that David knows about about whether or not it's a road over rail level crossing or a rail over road level crossing. So that, that, <laughs> that that's the one that determines who who does it sit with. Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, we want we want fewer, not more, in particular in the metros because the you know it's just it's just such a huge risk. Okay. Just a quick question um, on the um, Mojie attack. I, I've always sort of thought it seemed quite low, when, and you seem to have almost proven that's the case by achieving, you know, percentage of the way towards that target. So is that being reviewed now, or if not, when will it be reviewed? Because when you compare it to Mojie targets for road transport, it's been a completely different book. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I appreciate the challenges. I appreciate you know how hard all of this is, but it does seem pretty small. It, it'll it'll jump, it'll go up and we'll go down as we get to 2030. But the trend is what what matters to us. Is it being reviewed? No. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm meaning the actual target itself of like that. When, when you compare what's being required of you know that one that target shift up in the next few months or a year or so, or is that not? On the table. It's, it's not being looked at at the moment, no. Um, I mean, look, I'll just give you a little more reassurance around this. So, uh, is 14 percent achievable by 2030? Yes, it is. Um, does it mean that the government is currently doing a review of, of, a, of a percentage target that set just last year? No, it doesn't. Um, as major improvement projects are approved, that will start to shift things because we'll have different different numbers that we put into our network planning to the different volumes that we're starting to plan for. And therefore, you would expect to see a higher attainment of mode shift. So I would expect at that particular point, a sensible government will go, our target probably could be shifted because we're going to achieve it much sooner. So I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to avoid saying that they're not looking at it because it's not that they're not, that they've actively made a decision not to. It's just that we're one year in and, um, as things start to change and the program starts to be developed with new projects coming in, I'm certain that those things will start to shift. It just does seem a major inconsistency between the aspects of the transport system. I'll just comment on that. <laughs> we should be a risk. Good up, Angus, thank you. Um, that was really interesting because I know very little about it, so I've learned a lot today. Um, I was just wondering, um, within your, um, uh, your plans, uh, is there a, a component of research um, looking at more modern and futuristic uh, rail travel, um, such as magnetic levitation style, um, or anything that would be of more um, uh, use and less um, polluting than, than what we already have in New Zealand? Yes. Yes, yes, we have we have lots of people who spend all of their time thinking about wonderful ideas like that. Um, but they're all being channeled through a bit of work on the indicative business case of fleet decarbonisation. Um, so there's lots of different technology approaches. I think if you just put it, put it all in incredibly simple terms, for freight, you just want some huge behemoth who's able to pull a massive number of wagons of incredible weight. For passenger, you can do with something a bit lighter. Um, so for context, a DR locomotive that you'll see every day going across that bridge just out the, out the way there uh, is hauled by a DL. Uh, for the passenger services, they're hauled by a DF. Um, DF is like two-thirds the weight of a, of a DL. Um, so for magnetic side types of things, hydrogen, all of those sort of ideas, they're all being looked at for the fleet decarbonisation business case. I think where we'll end up landing is what is just most sensible for us in our, our particular bit of the network. Um, if you're thinking of ideas like high-speed rail, I mean, just to moderate expectations, you need to have uh, considerable improvement to the network in order to make high-speed rail work, mm -hmm. and that's because you want to have really long tracks of straight track. Uh, and so we don't have that in New Zealand because we're a wonderful country built on craggy islands made of volcanoes, earthquakes and floodplains, uh, and so we have wonderful waves all around the place. Uh, and in order to get it straight, you're talking about complete, completely level. Be a right here. I know you're right. We do need to move on. We're on page 45 of the 271 page agenda. So, Mayor Weber was here. We're going to be taking a lot of read as we move on. So, uh, I know, I know. 
So I would leave it to the mayors to move and sit in the seat of this report because they were the ones, Angus, who were instrumental in pushing to have you at the table. So Mayor Webber and Mayor Rees, I'll put up all those in favour. Please say aye. And Amanda, if you can also recall and note thanks to Kiwi Rail, please, aye. as part of that. Thanks so much. Andrew and Brendan, you're on stage. Good page, I thank you, Mr. Chair. Page 45, everyone. Now, these are two non significant variations. I know if Mayor Weber was here, he'd say take it as read. I'm quite happy to move. Uh, You're quite happy to move the recommendation. Information to be done. Correct. Mark. Correct. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Councillor Knees, you have to second it. Okay, before I put it, anything that you'd like to point out? Any salient points that you think need to be brought to our attention? Giant guys. Yeah, fine. Thanks. You're happy with that? Yeah, we will be real happy. Okay, I'll put it all those in favour. Please say aye. Right. Against right. Carrie. Moving on, Andrew, you stay there. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> And as I say, if Mayor Weber was here, you point out this is a 159-page report that we've all read, that we need to take it as read. Um, I can suggest we can go to the recommendations on page 110 for Rotorua and page 111 for Whakatani and Eastern Bay. So how do you want to handle this, Andrew? I always had your guidance, but essentially this is a final endorsement of the two scoping studies, which you received draft versions of at the meeting in May. Um, so we've made some minor amendments based off comments from both staff and members. A couple of huge reports that have been commissioned. Your Worship, Mayor Risa. Yes, I'd um, like another minor amendment because um, we've just passed the minutes on how I've noted that our population has changed considerably. You're still using 2018 population numbers for Oputiki District. Could you please update them? We are now at 10,300 according to our uh, elections uh, election statistics, so on page 143, a little under 9,000 people, well, that's even older than 2018. We seem to be shrinking instead of growing at a fast rate of knots. Please change it. Thank you. Apologies and no further question. Oh, oh Your Worship, Mayor Chadwick, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I'm just happy to move the recommendations. I think it's already been moved and it's been seconded. I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Yes, carry. I think that's the quickest the council's ever jumped over 159 pages. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so while we take the time to go to page 216, I'll invite Lorraine up. Lorraine, you're apparently selling us reshaping streets. No? Thank you. Both of you are coming up. Good. Might as well stay there, Andrew. Yes. <laughs> Come and join us, Lorraine. You might as well stay here too, because we're going to be moving along from here on in. Reshaping streets, everybody. Page 216, the hard copy. Patrick and Lorraine, welcome. Floor is yours. Um, morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to take the paper as read. Um, but today I'm seeking that uh, the RTC receive the report for Shaping Streets and endorse the report and the attached submission letter, which provides general support for what we're targeting to be Shaping Streets. I just have two quick revisions. Um, so on the third page of my paper, there is a table. And in the second column, in support, yes and no, I would like to change um, but no comment against Rotorelax Council to yes. It's just a small change. And the second change is in the submission letter. Um, the final sentence just above yours sincerely. It says, please find our comments below. We trust you find them constructive. I would just like to remove that sentence. I haven't actually sent, I haven't actually sent that letter yet, have I? Uh, no. no, no. That was all. Welcome. Any questions? Okay. Then? Questions to the team, everybody. Oh, Mayor Weber. Um, I'm quite happy to move it on the assumption we were all asked to sign the letter, and had I had assumed it had gone on the 31st of August, as it was dated. Uh, as this is for information only, I'm going to move the recommendations. Moved. Is there a seconder? 
Council leads to be moved and seconded. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against carry, moving over. Andrew, floor yours again, page TG4, Regional Land Transport Plan Implementation Report. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, this is the um, RLTP implementation report, uh, which includes the traffic light reporting as an appendix. This is a standard item within the RLTP monitoring program, and essentially it monitors the progress of the RLTP program. Um, there's not much more information than that, apart from what's in the appendix, so I'm happy to take questions on any line, line items or the paper itself. Mr Chairman, thank you. Questions to start? Anybody? Councillor Mays. With the large number of um, business cases that we've got in our program, and some of them are um, stacked behind others because mm -hmm. there's one you know that needs to happen before the other ones occur. Um, have we got the required resource right across the, um, the the staff network to actually deliver on these programs? And if not, what can be done about it to ensure that we are delivering to the timeframes? Ask um, for Chair um, Lorraine to comment as well, but in short, it is challenging. Um, we are trying to be pragmatic as much as we can. You'll see some of these business cases we <clears throat> get to chunk and do a little bit of work and then do others and come back to it to try and use the resources we have got. Um, something I've been very impressed with in this council is how the, uh, the staff do muck in as well. You know, so just don't just stick to your corner, you help the others as well as we, we are those gaps. We are actively looking for additional resources in, in the right places and of course in this market having mixed results there are some resources out there but not always very accessible so just trying to work, work as best we can through what resources we have got Raina, if you want to add to that you've been much, much more the front face facing that resource shortage out there it's worship there with them thank you i take you to page three um under the role of this committee one of the fundamentals is monitor implementation of the regional land transport plan as you know for well, I've been going on about this for 12 years, and we're getting close to um, some sort of... Uh, to me, this is fundamental. You list all the projects down, and then there's three columns. Is it on time? Is it within budget? Is it within scope? Um, that is standard project management 101. It's taken us 12 years to not get there. Uh, I wish the new committee all the very best. <laughs> I'll expose those compliments you wish it, so. Okay, any other questions, anybody? There's a recommendation on page 224. I will move it. Seconded Councillor Mees. All those in favour, please say aye. Against carry. Page 241, we're on the home straight, everyone. Lorraine, floor's yours. Regional Speed Management Rule. Regional Speed Management Plan. Oh, I'm sorry. Glenn, no, no. Just park up, Lorraine. Glenn, I'm sorry. Sorry, everyone, for going back. Um, I had two questions for that session. Um, one of them was related to the um, Totara Street project, which is on <coughs> nine in the RLTP, and it's now being merged. Um, when the committee was discussing that project, when the RLTP was being formulated, that was lit. Well, I remember I made a question, and there were some other comments around the committee around the scope of that project and why it was a separate project. Bearing in mind there's already a, a, a short-term, was it, uh, another Totara Street um, cycleway project, and there is also the bigger business case. What we were told at the time was that that was, it needed to be a separate project because it had environmental outcomes. So the implication of that is because of the uh, increase in emissions from the current Totara Street cycleway, that this would presumably, in my mind, would have led to a piece of work which would reduce the emissions. That was the implication of that. Now I see it's been scrapped. I'm just wanting to understand why it's been scrapped and if, if it was not needed and why was it there in the first place and ranked so highly in the regional list. Mm -hmm. And we were assured by TCC that it had to be a highly ranked project. Uh, yeah, through the chair, thank, thanks, Glenn. I think um, I don't have all the detail on hand, but I can go back to TCC to, to get some of that. But just yeah, if you could get back, because that's, that's got a huge community interest as well um, around some of that stuff. So the other one, um, if you could also, if you don't know the answer, um, perhaps one of you does, is the Arataki one, um, which in the context of what's happening, it's very totally focused, I apologise, but um, in the context of the well, overwhelming 
public feedback around some of the stuff over in Arataki at the moment. This will no doubt be contentious. And I, I just am bewildered why the sequence goes bus facility, um, business case, and then the accessibility. Surely the logic would be that you would do the business case, then you do the accessibility work, and then you decide where the actual infrastructure goes. And I wonder if there's any way you can explain that either now to the committee or get back to me on that as well. Yeah, I can probably come back to that more clearly, but the, the, the priority rankings in there don't. They don't refer to the timing as such. That's what you're. No, I'm meaning the actual commentary around it because it says that it will be. Because when you look at the timing of each of those three things, and, and so what I'm aware of is that there's a lot of um, con contention right now around the actual facility. But then, you know, the se I, I just can't follow the logic of the sequencing, and I'm just wondering if there's. Yeah, sure. Yeah, can I suggest that the staff get back to you and Andrew, can you copy all members of the committee into the response to those two questions that Glenn's posed and Ben's to you? Yeah, okay. Do you have that question? Yep, that's okay. Great. But we'll all be copied into those responses. Okay, back to page 241, everyone. Lorraine, regional speed management rule. Brilliant, Mr. Chair. Uh, happy to have if the report taken as read. Um, it's an update, uh, if you'll remember, the regional speed management rule was ratified the day of the last um, RTC, and this just points out the ramifications for RTC in terms of um, preparing a regional speed management plan. I'm happy to move. Second to his worship, Mayor Campbell. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against carried. And we're just dialing up Adam Fort at the moment. He's coming in by Zoom, page 249, everybody. Are you there, Adam? Yes, Chair, I am. Thank you. Um, rules, regional spatial planning. Yeah, look, through you, Chair, um, happy to take this report as read. It is, provides an update on the broader context around the uh, RM reform uh, with a specific focus on the Spatial Planning Act uh, and then covers off the um, three separate uh, areas of sub-regional spatial planning that the Regional Council is supporting in, in a collaborative way with our partners. So. Happy to take any sort of questions of clarification, or um, also your committee champion uh, Namuta is is there. She may wish to to add to that, but otherwise, um, yeah, just happy to take any questions. Just stay there. First off, please wish it Mayor Weber, then Commissioner Selwood. Mayor Weber. Well, as, as to the uh, the agenda, this is information. So I'm more than happy to receive the recommendation and uh, remove the recommendation. We received the report. It's old information. Thank you. That's noted. Commissioner Selwood. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, and I'm happy to second that. Um, but I just, in doing so, wanted to draw everyone's attention to the diagram on page 251 of our agenda, which shows the process of the regional spatial plan, or strategy, I should say, that requires the regional committee to reconcile seven piece, uh, separate pieces of legislation across seven local authorities in an environment where we all know there's not enough money to fund anywhere near what we need to invest going forward raises serious questions about actually the viability of this RM reform program. That's my um, my reaction. That's not a question. Thank you, Councillor Lees. Oh, thank you. We'll, we'll, I guess we'll uh, learn the shape of the um, uh, Spatial Planning Act within the next month. Um, but for some of the things that I hear, uh, I think have got major implications for us as an RTC, and it makes me wonder what other uh, legislative changes may be coming along to the um, Land Transport Management Act and what um, how the work of this committee is going to integrate with the um, Regional Spatial Plan. Another um, note that I read somewhere was that if a, um, major projects were identified in your spatial, regional spatial plan, there was a potential under the National Build Environment Act that they wouldn't have to go through the same facility process that other projects um, may need to go through because the whole idea of that 
EBA is to streamline things. So I just think we're going to have to pay very close attention to the provisions of the Spatial Planning Act and how it's all going to fit together because I think um, it's, it, there are going to be a lot of um, moving parts um, that we're going to have to pay attention to and try and ensure that we have something that works for us as a region. Uh, yes, I, I, surprisingly, I, I don't agree with Commissioner Selwyn. I think this is the one major reform piece of work that is absolutely significant for us in the regions. Um, and I see the sense in it. I see the linkages and I see the connectivity of what we need for economic development and growth in our region. Um, and this is going to drive us together like no other piece of legislation. And I think so important in the future of local government uh, when we look at what might be left to TLAs to uh, manage and manage locally. So I find this an incredibly important and significant piece of work. No problem about the seven bits. We're all good at that in the local government, so on. Um, we, we manage the acts uh, incredibly well and juggle them all, but I see this has got huge significance for us as a region. So um, I, I just want to leave on that salvo, really. Thank you. You'll get another chance to farewell us all shortly. So, Angus. Just to, just to make the point that there's I'm limited in what I can say about this issue because Kiro is a member of the Ministry's uh, transport sector feedback piece. Uh, so, but just want to make the, the, the offer that if the RTC was intending to submit through the select committee process and we were able to, I would, I'd quite like to have a conversation because there are a few thoughts we've got on the infrastructure side of things. It would be good to line ourselves up on if we're agreeable. Further comments? Okay, it's been moved, His Worship Mayor Weber, seconded with Commissioner Selwyn. I'll put it all those in favour, please say aye. It gets carried. Page 256, Lorraine, overview of the emission reduction plan. And we've got Jane here on Zoom, Jane Palmer. Jane, are you there? Yep, kia ora, I'm here. Jane, just for the benefit of the members, just explain your role with the organisation. Um, tēnā koutou katoa, <coughs> ko Jane Palmer toko ingoa. I'm Senior Planner on Climate Change at the Bay of Plenty Regional Council um, and <coughs> I've been involved in some high-level analysis of the Emissions Reduction Plan for the Bay of Plenty Regional Council and have provided some support in terms of that transport space so I can provide some more background on that wider ERP context um, if it's needed. Okay, thank you very much. Lorraine, are you leading this? Really, yes, Mr Chair, I am leading this, but the report was prepared by Catry. Unfortunately, um, Catry's away today. Um, we've got Jane here and um, our Environmental Sustainability Advisor, Ann Crowther, also uh, reviewed the report, so hopefully um, we'll take the chart, the lead chart. But <laughs> Do your best to sell it to us, go for it. <laughs> um, Again, um, this was uh, the, the emissions reduction plan came out around the time of the last meeting, and this was the long promised breakdown of what the implications for transport emissions reductions were um, out of the emissions reduction plan. Um, it's still um, quite dynamic and quickly evolving, so we've tried to talk. Um, mostly graphics and the information that we have and that we know into the report um, for you to hold and to have reference. Um, we'll obviously be reporting back um, in detail on uh, emissions reductions as they progress um, in our planning and various funding documents. Um, so there's um, an overview of the, earth, the transport emissions broken down um, sort of uh, sub-regionally across the Bay of Plenty, um, some of the tracking lines for reductions, key actions relating to uh, transport emission reductions um, for consideration by the councils coming out of ERB, um, and there's also some information on the, the modelling development the modelling tools that we use to um, assess and we'll be using to um, evaluate our emissions reduction in the future. 
James, do you want to fill in any gaps? Uh, not particularly. I think um, it'll be good to um, respond to any questions. I think the content okay. will pretty much covers the most things. Who worship? Okay, thanks for that. Who worship me, Turner? Thank you. Look, I just, Whakahani District Council's actually um, done some really big work in this area of measuring out first our own organisations and missions and, and then having a plan to reduce them and have even exceeded our own targets. We're now at that next stage where we're looking beyond ourselves. We've still got some way to go ourselves, but just in terms of what we, of what we manage. And um, certainly we're also making some quite big progress in the active transport space in terms of supplying really good opportunities and we've got some more of them on the thing. And I guess I'm just really happy on the beginning of the pro uh, beginning of the meeting is that our next challenge is to um, improve public transport. And that's that's a big challenge because it will be a completely different approach to what works in the Western Bay. So just saying that we we, we do are looking for help and support on that. Any other questions anybody? Okay, there's a recommendation there. I'll move it seeing that councillor needs. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against carry. Uh, we're very much on the on the tail end now, and I'll be guided by you, Amanda. We've got um, an apology from Inspector Brent Crow, but and that will be circulated to everybody. Okay, everyone's got it. Okay, right. And Stacy Spall, you with us, Stacy? Stacey's from the Automobile Association. She was on Zoom at one stage. Can you hear us, Stacey? Okay, we're going to have to move on. Um, it'll be for the incoming Regional Transport Committee to uh, sort out the membership. Um, and uh, we know you've arrived on the last day at the last hour at the last minute. It's a bit like armistice, isn't it? Um, so um, hopefully you'll be on board for the next Regional Transport Committee. So what we normally do now is have verbal updates from committee members and advisors. And uh, I'll also invite um, the mayors and anyone else who's here to farewell the troops and say any appropriate comments for the last meeting. So can I start with you, Mayor Turner? Anything you'd like to put on the table as we uh, come on our merry way? Everything I wanted to say throughout the meeting, so I'm not going to add, add to that. I just do want to acknowledge those who put in this will be our last meeting together. And the projects that you've led, um, within your district, that are now we're also going to look at and figure out how to copy. Um, <laughs> so thank you, thank you for your contribution. Um, really appreciate it. I'm not sure who else could I feel it. Malcolm's going to try and be here still. Um, Thank you, thank you to the two. Oh, yeah, sorry, Stevie. We had a wonderful farewell for her the other day, and um, I just, um, I've known Stevie prior to local government. Um, she held my hand when I was a young MP in her select committee that she was chairing, and was very really, uh, kind in her um, help to, from me coming up to speed. So um, we go back, back our way, and I'm very grateful for what she contributes. I actually suspect she's going to be a person that will continue to contribute. Um, beyond local government potentially because that's just who she is and uh, so thank you Stevie for everything that you've been for us um, through Rotary Rotary, that's fantastic yeah. um, So you worship Steve, um, I'll pass over to you, it can be a segue <laughs> to you so. Well all of you I've, I've enjoyed this committee immensely actually from the days that I used to come as an MP and I recall being with Pete Hodgkin, Hodgson when he said there's this amount of poo tear in the bucket to go to the region, and I'd really value the mayors of the region and the chair of regional council working together about how we spend it. And that was a great challenge, actually. And it was the beginning of regional thinking and setting our priorities together. I suppose as I leave, um, I have one frustration about the bit investment in projects that has driven us crazy here and that's nowhere more strongly reflected than, than the Eastern Arterial where we've nibbled away and caused um, enormous frustration for the community seeing you know, a one kilometre and then a three kilometre and then more research and then more compelling evidence needed. And I find that approach is 
not helpful actually to um, a TLA, but it's great now seeing David um, Spears and I mihi to you because it's quite a change, David, with Waka Kotahi, and that's coming to from New Zealand Rail because I think we're getting much more joined up thinking about where we go, and I really will keep a great interest um, in the region and um, especially with a role that I'm taking on with um, Tourism New Zealand, which I am enjoying, but that's going to be about what is the propositions that the regions have got to sell to the world. Um, and the other, the other, not a regret, but I do remember very much um, starting the Sustainable Cities uh, journey and we, we engaged in that ourselves as a council nine years ago and saw the importance actually of where we're going with climate change and, and carbon measurement. And I, I am sorry that we missed the opportunity to adopt that on a regional basis and for local government New Zealand to pick it up much urgent, much more urgently. But no regrets, um, you never win everything. I've really enjoyed it. Lyle, your chairing is exemplary. You get us through at a cracking pace, which has actually forced us to have a pre-meeting uh, and bring to the table those issues that really matter to us as a TLA. And I'll just finish on, I look forward to seeing locally led projects and regionally supported and nationally funded. Uh, thanks everybody. And thanks for coming mm -hmm. over and supporting my farewell. Kakite. David. You're too emotional for the same I will just point out to say that the um, chair of the Wakatahi board is retiring. <laughs> she wants a future job. <laughs> yes, the deputy chair actually comes from Rotorua, so uh, I don't think they have two, would they, Steve? No. Go, <laughs> go and put, in, put a poke in. <laughs> um, I'll start with uh, little bits of business if that's all right, uh, Chair. Um, first off, um, thank you very much around the State Highway 35 failure response. Uh, it was well coordinated, both from um, civil defence um, and from Waka Kotahi, especially uh, Roger Brady, but um, David uh, helping out, us out uh, when we were at conference. It's quite handy we were all in the same place at the same time as things were going on. Um, probably the first time that we've actually got funding to sort supplies to a place that was about to be cut off. And that came through the civil defence, which I thought was awesome. Um, and however, moving on to that, we've got to State Highway 35 and State Highway 2 resilience proposal which we have had um, a couple of ministry-led uh, Zooms, which you will present at chair. Um, what's happened is an ask here. Um, Waka Kotahi policy still needs to be reviewed on the state highway networks where the numbers aren't really supporting the investment that are needed. Um, and so part of that reflects in our regional transport plan on the priority levels um, it's just something I'd like to pick up, which I will nag on about, hopefully, when I'm in next time. Fingers crossed. Um, confirmation of the speed review, um, it would be good, um, but we still would like to know the timing of this um, and really feel that uh, local voice doesn't get listened to soon enough. There are very simple things that could change that are um, going to save lives within our sphere of our communities, which are on state highways, that we're not giving a chance to have a say on while we wait for a review that's going to be taking forever. And um, I think we've lost the common sense approach to health and safety on this particular thing around speed. Um, and I remind you that we know the names of the people who have died in fatal accidents on the parameters of our, our towns where we really do need to change speed speeds even before a review is undertaken, I believe. Um, overall condition of highways in terms of ride quality and safety is very poor. 
Um, I've reflected on that a little bit already. Um, where do we actually like to see the, the state highway bits, um, pavements and footpaths renewals on the state highway through our area as well? Um, and I'll, I'll ask again for next time, what's the policy on this? Um, transport management plans. Um, just a little concerned. They are being quite well in, implemented. Um, Snell's Road um, is an example, as, as was the Kutarevi recent works. Thank you very much. Um, however, <laughs> coming out of Kutarevi, heading west, we go 70 kilometres an hour, followed by 100 kilometres an hour for this much, and then back to 50, and then back to 100. You know, again, common sense, um, we're not getting it. That's all within 300 metres, by the way. What a waste of signage. Um, and the similar things happened at Snell's Road, exacerbated by, I can't say that word, by the fact that we go 70 over a bridge, past a, a retirement home, 50, 100, 50, and then back to 100. I, that's where the common sense approach of the local voice ought to be put into place straight away. Um, and Ohiwa Beach Road, Watahi Valley, Back Road, State Highway 2 upgrade. We're very excited about this happening, but we'd really like to have a um, um, provision for cyclists to be included. Um, Waka Kotahi are, are seeking the funding for it, but, but you know, really, if you're going to be supporting more cycling and, and for the health and safety issues mentioned, we, we do need a, um, a cycle bridge there, please. Um, today, um, our engineering team, um, Stace and Dale, are meeting with Waka Kotahi reps to look at the Matakerepu or Portuguese resilience assessment, so that's very exciting. Um, in fact, I'd just like to say thank you, Chair. Um, when I started on this three years ago, because I needed to be here as mayor, um, I'll use a fish analogy. I was definitely a flounder, floundering around thinking, what on earth am I doing? Um, and really look forward to the briefing um, from yourself for new members. Um, you know, I'm, I'm quietly hoping I'll be back here again, and I'd like that for myself because um, it's taken all the three years to catch up to speed. Um, feeling a bit more comfortable in this space, but I kind of felt a bit like an inanga trying to get up to my breeding grounds, but they had no um, ways through the culverts or the, uh, you know, the drains and the barriers, but uh, getting there anyway. But um, one of the things I felt that was been really good was your um, undertaking of uh, having the meetings with the ministers. We've had three meetings in this triennium, um, and we've been able, I think, you know, one, they've come and talked to us about where they're at and where they're going, and we've had um, um, a lot of really good uh, questions and uh, pushes at the ministers from this regional transport, and I salute the those of you with the experience who have led um, our 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 fight for what we're wanting to see happen. So thank you very much for that. And last of all, um, thank you very much, colleagues. It's worship, Mayor Campbell. It's not allowed to be a campaign speech. Should be yeah, no, 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 campaign yeah. speech. Uh, However, I have been around the traps in the last uh, three or four weeks uh, with Chairman Leader and, and uh, three others. Um, and it's been a bit of a wake up call, to be honest. Um, it's a big job. It is a big job, and 60% of the region is in the Eastern Bay of Plenty. And um, I, I think that we've got to take take note of that. A lot of a lot of heavy uh, heavy uh, traffic movements. Um, our roads are falling apart, and no fault of David or any of his colleagues. Um, you know, funding is short, and so I have to say that. Um, if I'm if I'm lucky enough or unlucky enough to be on regional council, um, I'm going to fight the good fight for the Eastern Bay, obviously, but also for the whole of the whole of this region because it's a, it's a pretty important hub. Um, can I just say um, it's good to have David around the table. 
Um, I will be chasing them for those times, David. Um, and, and Angus, because we've battled so long to have a representative for, for rail here, and, uh, and we finally got it. Um, it's, um, it's been a hell of a journey for me. This is 21 years of this game, and I, I'm listening to my, my friend Gary Weber across the way. I think we're still dealing with some of the business that we were doing 21 years ago. And that's frustrating. And it's not, not necessarily the fault of, of, of this committee or, or anybody. You don't want to point, point the finger at anybody because it's just the, the nature of the beast. Um, the work never stops, like Steve says. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's the business we're in. And um, if it did stop, well, we'd really be in trouble. Uh, can I just say, uh, from the staff's point of view, that have, have, have um, you know, they've been really, really good to me anyway. Um, uh, but there is some failings within regional council, I believe, and territorials, and I'm hearing it around the traps. We don't talk well enough together. We don't share the, the, um, um, the good news, is, except we run around putting out the fires for all the bad news. And we, should be, we should be telling people that we are doing some good stuff, um, but we should be listening also. We, we've, got to, we've got to go out and, 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 and talk locally. Um, it's so important, especially for roads. You can't, in, in, in the Eastern Bay, um, uh, if, if, for instance, it was the status quo, I, I, I feel for Doug. Uh, he can't be there all the time. Bill Clark's running around um, doing, doing all sorts of things. And that's for you need to be talking to your, um, your councils, and more than anything, your community boards, because they're on, they're on the ground, they're local, and they see things, they hear things, uh, particularly with, with um, transport and rivers and, and the like. So, yeah, it's, like I say, it's been a, been a heck, of a, heck of a ride. Can I just say something uh, which I omitted to, to talk about the other night when I was in Rotorua for Steve Chadwick? She's been a champion for transport. We've, we've, we've battled and, and, uh, uh, and I, I, I know she mentioned the zombie town thing, and you were all part of that. Um, we were probably getting flushed down the down the down the valley track, to be honest, um, uh, ten years ago. Now it's turned around, and, and Lynn just talked about their population uh, has gone up over ten thousand. Kaurau has gone up from five thousand nine hundred to seventy six hundred. Um, things are changing around, so there's a, a there's going to be a big challenge, uh, and the spatial planning thing is going to be so so critical. I think to to where do we go from here? So um, yeah, it's a uh, it's a um, work in progress, and I thank you very much, Mr. Chair, um, for all your um, good, good cheering and wit that goes with it. It's most important. Goodness, if we're going to sit around the table here for the, the amount of years I've been here, and I have to say I've had a lot of fun, and um, and uh, and I respect my my peers around the table. So thank you very, very much, and uh, look forward to whatever comes on this on the eighth of uh, October. I might have to go and buy myself an electric bike again. So, thank you. Commissioner Selwood, you're assured of a seat at this table, so you're one of the lucky ones. Yes. <laughs> go for it. Thank you. Nothing really to add other to acknowledge, like everyone else, the fantastic uh, contributions that have been made by uh, all of the members who are leaving us. Um, and uh, we've, there's no doubt we've got some enormous challenges going forward, but uh, we have achieved a lot in the time that... Um, those members have been sitting around the table. Um, our big challenges are in around um, that collaboration to develop a, a regional spatial plan and the wider debate about how we actually fund and deliver. Um, and I think that is going to be uh, the major question for the new committee coming in. Thanks very much. Liam? I was reflecting on at the start of the training that perhaps the, the place of environment in, in transport planning, where it is now, that this might seem to be a bit wonky. Um, and I think you know, it's become apparent that the central government has got quite a strong agenda in that space. It'd be interesting what happens after the next general election. Um, I think, for me, the big thing is observing what's happening across the Bay, particularly in some areas. There's an increasing tension between community understanding of these issues and what those of you around the table understand. The gap is much, much bigger, I think. And I think reshaping streets as you whiz through the agenda so quickly, I was um, thinking that that 
will perhaps be a, a key um, issue for a lot of people is how to actually have proper community engagement. Thinking of what Mayor Turner said and what Mayor Campbell has just said, um, I, I can see all sorts of issues coming up, but one of them is um, apparent in terms of some work being done uh, in the Bay right now in terms of is the goal to slow down cars or is the goal to speed up buses, for instance. Um, and, and what I hear from some staff at some councils um, is that it might be both, but particularly the slowing the cars. I'm not sure if the, if the public are in that space at all. Um, and I think things like inline, uh, in, well, I think they're called inline, are they? Uh, bus stops where you've got buses stopping in the middle of the road. Um, I know there's a lot of concern for a current project in Tauranga around that. And it's sort of taken as a given now that that is the safest, best option, whereas it was only four years ago that that was strongly argued against by the very same councils and a government agency that that was not a safe and accessible option. So I see all sorts of um, big issues here, and, and I know the disability and um, you know elder advocates and others are very concerned about things like that. So I think probably going back to what Mayor Campbell and others have said, the, the community is and might be where the sustainability comes into environmental sustainability. You know, so the environmental policies might set out to achieve something, but to make that sustainable, I, I think, um, you know, probably speaking more for the, those of you coming back to, onto the committee next time, I think that's absolutely critical. Um, I do want to wish Mayor Campbell and Mayor Chabot, if she's still there, and Mayor Weber all the very best. Um, I'll, if I'm lucky enough to come back around the table, um, I'll, I'll miss some of the entertainment value. Let me in, Gary. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but I have learned a lot, and um, thank you all for having me here. Yeah, Weber, you're very much our elder statesman here, so I'll keep it to bouquets. <laughs> uh, that will be difficult. Um, because, Angus, this is the first time we met, I just gave a little note, I'm not known for my patience. Um, <clears throat> But as I reflect on my 14 years in local government, I started off with the Mokara Community Board, and one of the proposals was the Linden Lifestyle Zone, and that will, will be allowed to build houses on that <clears throat> when the TNL gets put in place. So that's uh, 14 and 10, 25 years. That's not a bad attempt. Um, the Tarawana Northern Link, we've managed to change the name of that from the Tarawana Northern Link to the Takatumi Northern Link. Um, and I'd have to say Western Bay has achieved that in the Amokara Roundabout in spite of the Regional Transport Committee. So uh, thanks to David and a couple of ministers. Um, I suppose from, from my perspective, it's great to have David and Angus here because my frustration at these meetings is the lack of strategic thinking and the lack of performance management. We have to do a regional transport plan and we have to monitor it. In 12 years, we've done four transport plans and I don't think we've done any monitoring. Project management to me is fundamental. You list your projects, as I said before, are they on time, are they in budget, are they in scope? When we come to these business cases, sorry, the scope is up front. You know what the scope is, so you do the business case around that. You don't do a business case instead of what the scope is. The number of business cases I've seen done, I think we did 10 for the Takatim in Northern Link um, from 1991 through till um, today. And, and I just wonder if we'd saved all that money and just done one at the end. We might have put the road in place uh, 10 years ago. But um, it's been an interesting committee to be on. Uh, but thank you for tolerating me. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Is there a bouquet in there anywhere? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you doubt it. Angus, I, I think uh, before you start, I think uh, you will be picking up the accolades today and the thanks for having you here. It was, and it was due thanks to some of the mayors, and I think particularly Mayor Campbell, who really pushed to have you here. So when I say you, I mean. So, any final? Sure, I'd just like to make. Just a brief word. It's uh, been a year since I was gazetted. Uh, which is the most unusual recruitment I've ever been involved in, but because it had to be a co kind of member of the Bay of Plenty RTC. So uh, we, we certainly really value our membership here. I know I said at the beginning, and I'll say it again, 
of every meeting I come to because it matters. Uh, the job that you all do uh, in representing your communities and making sure that their views are heard in the transport planning process is absolutely critical. Uh, now, the key thing from our perspective is that we can quite easily be forgotten in those situations because if you're not here and you're not thinking about it, why would you, right? Uh, so our, our being here and your willingness to have us come along uh, matters to us about the value of the QRL. So just want to say thank you uh, to my new mate, Gary. Thank you uh, to CV, who I've known for much longer. Thank you, acknowledging all of those of you who are standing down, but also who are putting your hand up. And it's, um, it's a great service. Thanks. Thanks, Angus. My colleague, Councillor Bees. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. I'll leave it to you to give the valedictory uh, speeches. I'd just like to say, uh, I'll give a brief update on a couple of regional council projects, but I just want to say how much I've enjoyed working with you. It's not an easy committee, and it's not well understood out there. Um, a lot of people don't understand that the decisions made uh, around the regional land transport plan are actually made by a committee of mayors and, and representatives across the region. Um, Anyway, the projects I just wanted to talk about um, is the uh, Bay of Plenty Regional Public Transport Plan. Um, we've had um, that plan in draft and we went out um, to seek submissions and I really want to acknowledge that um, Mayor Turner, Commissioner Selwood, um, Councillor Thurston and myself were on that hearing panel, so it was really good to get that crossover between the RTC perspective and the public uh, uh, transport planning perspective. Um, so deliberations have been held and the, um, the resulting plan has been presented to the Public Transport Committee um, tomorrow for endorsement and then that will go through to the Regional Council uh, for sign-off next week. Um, hopefully they will sign that off. So thank you to all those around the table that have been involved in that. Um, within the Regional Council works now well underway on the initial phases of our bus decarbonisation feasibility study, uh, with a stock take and marketplace analysis for how to decarbonise the urban and school bus fleet by 2035, so staff are work, starting that work. Um, we've also got a regional risk, assess, risk assessment being undertaken by Tonkin and Taylor which is considering uh, risks to ports, airport, airports, rail, and it will draw on the lifelines uh, risk assessments. So what that's doing is evaluating the exposure and vulnerability of the transport elements, of uh, particularly um, to a range of climate hazards using multiple climate scenarios and timeframes, and that'll be really important to feed into our um, ROTP consideration and the spatial plan, obviously, as that rolls out. And lastly, um, within the smart growth um, activity, the Regional Council is leading the drafting of the climate change and natural hazards sections of the upcoming joint spatial plan, and that will include consideration of the National Adaptation Plan. I think we all need to be considering all of those big instruments that are coming at us that um, will have quite um, an impact on our um, operations going forward. I'll pass to you, Mr Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lees. Well, that's the end of the meeting and that's the end of the triennium. So um, I'd just like to formally move a resolution recording a vote of thanks to members, advisors and staff for their contributions and support over the triennium. Um, and to acknowledge the fact that we got through a 271-page agenda today and uh, if we hadn't been taking things as read at the uh, behest of his worship, um, we might have been here a hell of a lot longer. But... Um, would you like to second my resolution, Your Worship? Thank you so much. I'll declare the meeting closed and invite you all to stay for lunch. And uh, yes, one thing. Sorry. Mayor Campbell, sorry. My apologies. Um, there's there's one person that's going to be around the table. My deputy. She's already in, unopposed. So she will be one person that's going to be around the table. So I'd just like to acknowledge that, please, if I can. Thank you. Thank you to everyone on Zoom today, and uh, particular thanks to Commissioner Selwood and Her Worship Mayor Chadwick. Uh, I don't think there's anyone else here I can't see on the screen. So, um, oh, Councillor Von Battleson, thank you for your endurance. <laughs> 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 All